Good morning. Welcome to the Delnark County Board of Supervisors meeting this day, August 14th, 2018. The board has returned from closed session. Liz, is there anything to report out of closed session today? No reportable action. Thank you. At this time, I'd like to pause briefly for a moment of reflection. Please join us. Thank you. Will you please stand and join us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Ready? Begin. I, I pledge, pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> Do we have any new employees to introduce today? Seeing none, we'll move on. At this time, I'd like to request any deletions, corrections, or additions from board members to the agenda. Okay, seeing none, we'll go ahead and move on with our consent agenda. Comments from members of the public may be heard at this time regarding consent agenda items only. Is there any public comment on consent agenda at this time? Okay, we'll go ahead and bring it back to the board. Do we have a motion from the board on the consent agenda only? Move for approval. Second. We have a motion and a second on consent agenda items 1 through 17. Tyler, can you please pull the vote? Supervisor Cowan? Yes. Supervisor Gitlin? Yes. Supervisor Berkowitz? Yes. Supervisor Hemmingson? Yes. Chair Howard? Yes. All right. Let's go ahead and move forward with budget transfer item which is item number 26 on your agenda. Approve and adopt budget transfer item 07-11, the amount of $4,390 within the livestock budget to transfer surplus funds from city contract line to cover overages and several line items as requested by the Agricultural Weights and Measures Inspector. Move to approve uh, budget transfer 07-11. Second. We have a motion, a second. Public comment. Okay, we'll go ahead and bring it back to the board. Kylie, please pull the vote. Supervisor Gitlin? Yes. Supervisor Cowan? Yes. Supervisor Berkowitz? Yes. Supervisor Hemmingson? Yes. Chair Howard? Yes. All right, we're gonna go ahead and move forward with item number 21 at this time. Review information prepared by the Community Development Department in response to the 2018 SIGMA, which is the State Groundwater Management Act draft basin plan released by the Department of Water Resources for the Smith River Basin and direct the Community Development Department to finalize and submit the proposed basin agreement to the Department of Water Resources Basin Prioritization Porthole as requested by the Natural Resources Goals Committee. Good morning, Randy. How good are you? Good morning. Excellent. How are you guys? Doing terrific. Good. Good to see you. Um, so I guess for the, uh, for the board, SIGMA or the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act isn't a new topic, uh, but for apps for the public, maybe just kind of a brief uh, overview. So uh, in response to, you know, obviously uh, very difficult water conditions on a statewide basis, uh, the state of California passed a collection of uh, bills that were subsequently signed into law by Governor Brown, which are collectively referred to as a SIGMA, or the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. Um, for you know, many, many years, uh, groundwater hasn't been regulated in the same respect that surface water is under current statute um, in the state of California. Um, so again, um, in response to, you know, really kind of dire uh, water conditions, groundwater conditions throughout uh, much of the state, uh, we have this new collection of uh, regulations which we're in the process of, enfor of, of implementing, uh, not yet enforcing. Um, as part of the preliminary uh, process, uh, what the Department of Water Resources did uh, was uh, preliminary assessments of ev essentially every groundwater basin throughout the state of California, and that includes the Smith River uh, Plain Groundwater Basin, which is a defined uh, geographic unit. Um, as part of the initial uh, prioritization, which took place in 2013-2014, the basin was identified as a medium priority basin and was assigned, um, I believe, about 18 uh, priority points. 
The priority points uh, were based off of eight different components. Uh, the components were population and population growth. Uh, and this is, I should uh, specify, within the basin itself, not within the entire county. Um, the total number of public supply wells, the total number of production wells, uh, the total number of irrigated acres with groundwater, um, what the reliance on groundwater is. So in other words, how much of your water is provided uh, via surface water and how much of your water is provided via groundwater. Um, and then the, the, the last two uh, components had to do with other impacts that may exist within the basin um, and new information that may come uh, through the assessment process. And so again, as part of that 2014 uh, prioritization under uh, what was then referred to as CASGEM, uh, the, the Smith River Basin was identified as a medium priority basin. What that meant and what it continues to mean is that any basin rated as a medium or, or a higher, very high priority basin is subject to the implementation of SIGMA, which principally has to do with the development of a groundwater management plan um, to ensure sustainable conditions um, are provided for within the basin. Um, in response to the 2014 uh, prioritization, uh, the direction that we as staff received from the board was to look critically at the data that was being put forward by the Department of Water Resources su suggesting that the basin should be a medium priority basin. Uh, we did do that. Um, we had a number of conversations with the Department of Water Resources staff. They actually visited the area um, on a couple of different occasions and I, and I, and I think you know, we made a lot of progress. Um, however, there wasn't really the opportunity to actually affect any change with that prioritization ranking at that point. And what they told us was essentially that there would be a reprioritization process that would play out where we'd have an opportunity to put forward um, our thoughts and concerns with the prioritization as it was made um, initially. So uh, we're now in that process uh, for the reprioritization. Uh, we've had a number of conversations again uh, with the Department of Water Resources staff. They've been very good to work with. Um, but in response to the um, updated prioritization, we do have uh, some comments, uh, which we hope may affect uh, some change. Um, you know, essentially, the process that the Department of Water Resources used on a statewide basis was a one-size-fits-all approach. Uh, they were looking at these eight specific criteria and they were looking at individual basins based on those components but what it didn't really take into account were local conditions in a lot of cases um, and so what you have uh, before you today is a draft assessment that we as staff have put together in collaboration with uh, the rcd out in smith river um, local stakeholders um, and the farm bureau and so this assessment essentially looks at every one of those individual components as they've been put forward by the Department of Water Resources. And it provides kind of, um, you know, a different perspective, I guess would be the best way to put it. Uh, the data sources that the Department of Water Resources are using are perfectly fine. Um, obviously they're legitimate, they've been vetted through their process, but there is other information out there uh, that we've tapped into and we're putting forward what, what again we feel is maybe more appropriate um, uh, kind of characterization of the conditions within our basin. Obviously, we know um, just anecdotally here on the North Coast that we're in a very different uh, climate than much of the rest of the state. Uh, we don't have the same declining groundwater levels that they do, for example, in the Central Valley in Southern California. You can look at the groundwater elevation data uh, within our basin and it's fairly consistent. You do have seasonal fluctuations between the dry and the wet seasons, uh, but over time, it's essentially a straight line. And so, um, I guess in summary, um, you can look at every one of those individual data points um, and what we've done is we've uh, collected data from different data sources related to population, population growth, um, total number of public supply wells, total number of production wells, every one of those individual data points. And what, what we've done, I think, is put together a characterization of the basin that's probably uh, more accurate based on local conditions. So I hope you've all had an opportunity to uh, review the assessment. If there's any specific questions about any of the data that we've uh, provided, now would be the time. Um, the cutoff for providing comments to the Department of Water Resources to actually affect any change is gonna be August 20th. So that would be next week. Uh, this is a nearly complete uh, draft version of the assessment. We're still looking for some, um, some final data uh, from the Farm Bureau out in Smith River just to kind of um, iron up uh, some of these issues specific to uh, surface water and groundwater irrigation practices uh, within the within the plain. 
uh, right now, the way that it's reflected is that all of that agricultural uh, irrigation is via groundwater, and we know that isn't the case. Uh, what that'll do will actually uh, reduce our percentage of reliance on groundwater. <clears throat> Excuse me, whenever we get some of that surface water included, uh, which should make this number look a little better. Um, the, the Department of Water Resources applied um, a prioritization score of 19 and a half as part of this most recent uh, prioritization process. We've calculated a 14 and a half, but the key uh, element to consider is that the total groundwater usage is below what they consider to be the de minimis amount, which is 9,500 acre feet of groundwater use within the basin. Um, based on the total uh, domestic water use and agricultural water use, uh, we've calculated I believe about 3,500 acre feet, which is significantly less than what the Department of Water Resources calculated. But again, this is based on data uh, put forward by the US Geological Survey. This isn't something we came up with ourselves in terms of water usage. Uh, so we feel pretty confident in that number. Uh, we would just like to get the final numbers from the Farm Bureau, uh, get that piece included into this assessment and transmitted to the Department of Water Resources and then ultimately they'll make whatever decision they make. So again, I'm available for any questions if there are specific questions about uh, any of these components. Questions or comments for Randy at this time before we move to public comment? Randy, what is the impact on the property owner who has a well? What's the impact? What, what, if we don't answer this, what can the property owner expect? Yeah, I, I, <clears throat> I didn't want to get into um, you know, all of the background leading up to Sigma because we've had a number of conversations uh, to get us to this point, but that is a, a great question. And, and I think fundamentally that's, you know, kind of where our concern well, let me, is. Let me cut it shorter. Is Pardon? there a taxing component here? Pardon me? Is there a taxing component? Is there going to be a fee to there, there, extract there, there, your own water? Yes. That, that's what I want you to do. Yes. So to, as part of one of the previous presentations, to. you know, that, that was kind of the point that we hit on was currently um, users of groundwater, whether they're individual domestic water users, whether they're agricultural water users, um, don't have to, um, there, is, there isn't that financial uh, liability. You know, obviously if, if you have a well, you can extract the water um, and it's, you know, for all intents and purposes, unregulated. Um, we know, again, with, with where we're at in the state of California, we don't have the water issues that they do elsewhere. It's not to say that managing groundwater is a bad idea. I think it's a great idea. It's just, is it appropriate for your, uh, for your situation? And within our uh, groundwater basin, again, you can look at the data for yourself and managing groundwater to that level, I think, when you look at the fact that this is a disadvantaged community, uh, certain census blocks within the community are actually severely disadvantaged, that it would be a significant cost to individual property owners up to uh, commercial users, certainly. Yeah, I just uh, have a comment. Uh, having worked on this for quite some time, you, you did a great job, Randy, of capturing uh, everything that we've been discussing and, and uh, exactly what uh, um, I think uh, more what the basin actually looks like than, mm -hmm. what, than what was painted, the picture that was painted by the department. So um, I think we're on the right track. Unfortunately, every time we do something like that, they change the rules a little bit. So. That's what we have to continually look out for. But great job. Thank Thanks. You. Thank you. Okay, if there's no further questions, we're going to go ahead and open it up for public comment. This is on uh, the state groundwater plan. I'm sorry. I thought you said public comment. Yeah, on the state ground. Uh, oh. Sorry. Item number 21. Please, Ms. Cooper. Hi, I'm Cooper. Um, uh, I sorry I didn't have a draft comments for you. My um, computer has failed. Um, but <laughs> uh, I have um, the Friends of Del Norte is um, going to be submitting substantial comments to this. Can you uh, turn off your? Oh yeah. Sorry, it's giving feedback in the mic. That's right. Mm -hmm. Don't count this against my time. I won't. <laughs> all right. So, um, first of all, I'm not confident in the figures of usage. Um, we're using a general U.S. Um, figure for for uh, 
individual use of residents. Um, I took the time to look at um, as close as I could come to um, what uh, some of our residential areas are using. I, um, we have some very overdeveloped um, areas in the county that uh, could be very problematic. Uh, the Western Elk Creek drainage and the East Lower East Side Lake Earl. Those areas receive um, water from a very limited air uh, basin that doesn't get the Smith River directly. You have allowed very dense one acre zonings and um, and we have no monitoring wells in those areas. So I took the time to look at Birch Track, who keeps metered records for individual homes. And we are using du at least double what this figure that you have calculated is for our residents there. You know, that's not apartments or mobile homes, that's strictly residents. And when you take that, and look at what we the density we've allowed in certain areas. You know, we, we have um, 683. You know, in uh, anyway, it's it's about it comes to about double the usage in those problematic areas. Second of all, we have uh, a v inherent vulnerability when you look at these graphs. Yeah, yes, we bounce back year after year with our, our water levels, but we also, if you look at the last graph, which is the only relevant one, because the other two are right near a water source. So that's going to subdue any effects that you see. That, that is not a true tale. But when you look at the last graph line, and also there are two other graph lines in the county um, that are relevant, um, it shows that we, we bounce up, but we go all the way down, all the way down in dry years. What that means is that if we experience a more than one year drought, we are in trouble. I mean, a real drought, like that year that we didn't have any rain in winter. Remember that? If you get that kind of jet stream situation for more than one year, you're not going to bounce back. And most people's wells are very, very shallow in this county. So you're going to have a heck of a lot of people that are impacted very strongly if we don't have conservation measures in place. Um, the other situation is the if possibility of groundwater um, intrusion, um, saltwater intrusion, and also the great problems we have, threats to our groundwater from lily bulb pollution. Uh, there are a number of reasons why we are a, um, have been considered, um, you know, vulnerable. Thank you. And, and they have geologists working on this. They have water specialists working on it. They did not do this lightly. Thank you. Thank you. Please. Please state your name for the record. Yes, sure. Felice Pace. I am uh, living in Klamath Glen. I'm the water chair for the North Group uh, Redwood Chapter Sierra Club. I uh, worked for the, uh, a coalition of groups on the legislation we're talking about here today, and I worked for them on the regulations as well. Um, as far as uh, your data, what you submit goes, DWR will evaluate it. I haven't had a time to evaluate it yet, but I'm very concerned you're taking final numbers from the Farm Bureau was mentioned today, and that would be uh, non-verifiable numbers. And if uh, growers in the ag community want to really uh, get DWR uh, involved in re-looking re at those kind of numbers, they're going to have to bring their real numbers to the table, not uh, what the, comes from the Farm Bureau, and they're going to have to be verified. But, you know, that DWR will do this. These are statewide criteria and only the ones that apply, apply. For example, is there seawater intrusion? Well, over in the Scott and the Shasta, where I used to live, uh, you know, uh, they don't have seawater intrusion. It's over by Mount Shasta, no seawater intrusion. So they don't use that criteria. But water quality is a criteria. And I think most of you know or should know 
that there's water quality problems up there that we've had them in our community CSD Smith River and in reservation ranch community systems water quality problems over the years and uh, some of the old chemicals including some of the old chemicals that are newly regulated and where we're heading towards viol possible violations so we you know those those things there's a whole set of criteria and you know every basin thinks they're unique and your cover letter really says unique uh, and uh, every basin is unique but you know this this basin Smith River Plain isn't that different from Eel River Plain uh, some of the most of the same issues so yeah they're unique but uh, I, I think you're what I'm really disappointed in is the lack of progress you seem to be in denial that you're going to get out of this you're not going to have to do it and I think uh, that's going to be proven wrong and uh, there's equity in this rating system and the county so far has made no progress it's just denial no outreach to stakeholders that are called for in the act in lieu of CEQA we have stakeholders specifically named out uh, no outreach to disadvantaged communities specifically required by the act no formation of an advisory committee uh, you know you're way behind the other counties even Siskiyou County in implementing <coughs> Sigma because you think you're going to get out of it I guess um, so anyway uh, I, I wish you would revise your uh, cover letter because I don't think it's uh, it's very good and I don't think it reflects well on the county thank you thank you any other public comments on this agenda item? Good morning. Good morning, Victoria Dickey. I live in uh, Bob Berkowitz district. Um, I couldn't hear all of what Randy said, but um, if it says that you're going to be charging people who have their own well to use their own water, I think that needs to be addressed. Um, it costs a lot of money to put in a well. You have all the equipment. It's not spending $30 a month down at the city. Uh, and uh, the one thing I have noted about Crescent City is we're not connected to the rest of the state. We hardly have a road. We don't have water going south. If we're successful with the state of Jefferson movement, we won't even be part of this state. Um, my thought is that you can save all the water you want to. And don't get me wrong, I'm not for, when I leave this planet, I want it better than when I came. But uh, if I don't drink a glass of water or take an extra shower, that water goes right straight into the ocean. It doesn't go to Los Angeles. It doesn't go to San Francisco. It goes nowhere. So I think it's fine and dandy to do a study so that you know what you have here. But I think you need to be very <coughs> careful before you start um, taking care of Los Angeles. The minute you connect up to them, we're not only going to be nothing but a park that doesn't get visited, we're going to be a dry park. Thank you very much. Other public comment on this agenda item? Okay, seeing none, we'll go ahead and bring it back to the board. Other comments for Randy at this time? Okay. Randy, just like to say thank you for putting this together. Um, I know we've been at this for going on two and a half years or longer now. Um, just in response to some of the statements that were made, you know, the data really that goes into this model that made us into a meat and priority basin needs to be factual. And there was a great deal of information that went into these various categories and line items that were used to model this county that weren't accurate. And it took a great deal of time, almost two years to be exact, to get us to a point of getting that factual data together. And what we were able to determine, as Randy articulated, was that DWR did not have their facts correct. Um, when it was looked into why they didn't, it made a lot of sense. And they recognized those problems. One of them was as significant as including our rainy collector, which supplies water for the Crescent City, as a groundwater collecting device. But by definition, under DWR's own definitions, a rainy, rainy collector is a surface water collector but they had included it in their modeling program, 
where they left it out of Mad Rivers, for instance. So there was discrepancies that made it into the model that we just could not make sense of. We found the facts, we put them back in this model, and as you've heard, we've calculated our own numbers, which actually make more sense to what we see here on the ground. Specifically for the farming community that's done a lot of homework in this, to look at groundwater drafting versus surface water drafting versus mixed use landscapes. That data was collected by DWR through a college graduate at Humboldt State that essentially drove around and tried to identify crop types on fields and tried to identify just by driving around whether or not that, gra that ground was being irrigated or non-irrigated and if it was irrigated, was being irrigated by surface water or groundwater. But without being able to go and ask the property owner how your ground's being irrigated, they just arbitrarily colored it in. And so that data had to be looked at and gone back and checked out and verified, and that's exactly what happened with every property owner within the basin. And so there's been a lot of time, a lot of energy put into this, and an amazing amount of resources from the county, specifically with um, community development department's time and Randy's time to get to this point we are at today. But the county wanted to make sure that the, at least the information going into the model was factual. And I think we've gotten to that point today. But certainly, um, to no extent, the effort was there. And we appreciate your time, Randy, on this. And uh, with that, I'd like to see if there's a motion on the table or any further comments. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah I move to uh, um, direct the uh, CDD to finalize and submit the proposed uh, basin assess assessment to uh, DWR basin prioritization portal. Second. We have a motion and second on the table. Kylie, can you please pull the vote? Supervisor Callan? Yes. Supervisor Gitlin? Yes. Supervisor Berkowitz? Yes. Supervisor Hemmingson? Yes. Chair Howard? Yes. All right, we're going to go ahead and move on with item number 18 at this time, which is our public comment period. Members of the public may address the board on matters which are within the jurisdiction of the board. If you're addressing the board regarding a matter listed on the agenda, you may be asked to hold your comments so the board takes up that matter. Please limit your comments to three minutes or less. Public comment, please. Good morning. Good morning. Norma Williams, uh, Chapter President, Delmar County Employees Association, SEIU 10 to 1. I have permission from an employee to read her statement to you. This was submitted by, and also to identify her in her department. This was submitted by Treasurer Co Cox, Child Support Specialist 2, Delmar County Department of Child Support Services. I am a single mom of two boys. We live in an RV at a local RV park and are struggling to make ends meet. Since moving here, I have come to realize that this town is now charging the same rate of rent as Sacramento County, but the workers are making much less. Now, I'm not saying that we need to make, that we need to be making the same pay as Sacramento, but when the cost of living here is the same or more than living in a big city, and the pay is so much less, well, it's hard for a lot of us to get by. With the cost of living and the lack of pay, I cannot afford to rent a place as I'm barely getting by living in the RV. Now, since I've moved here, my oldest son has had a few injuries and the medical bills are adding up at a faster rate than I can afford to pay. I myself am now having to have procedures done to check for cervical cancer and the out-of-pocket costs are killing me, figuratively speaking. I have to give up some of our food money and gas money now, now, that's not cheap here either. It costs more for gas here than it does in Sacramento, about 20 to 50 cents more depending on the gas station. She's not lying about that either, it's true. When giving up food money, that means I either eat less or I skip a meal or two a day to make sure that my boys eat. And when it comes to skipping on gas money, that's a hard one because as it is, I do the bare minimum. It's not fair to my children because we already don't have money to go out and do anything fun. I go to work Monday through Friday, and the weekends we sit home because I can't afford to take them anywhere because even free places cost gas money to get there. Since finding out that I have to have procedures done to see if I have cervical cancer, my stress level has, has been beyond high because what, it, because what if they do find can cancer? How much is it going to cost, cost me? What am I going to have to skip payments on to make sure that I am taken care of so that I am here to take care of my children? I pay $152.37 per check for medical for my two boys, and I pay $68.46 per check for my medical. 
Then I have all the out-of-pocket cost. At this time, at this time, at this time, I'm sorry, I am over three thousand dollars in debt just for medical bills alone, and that's not taking into consideration all the procedures that I have coming up. The only thing that I have to say is, is this acceptable to you? Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, board. Charlene Blackburn. I've been a proud employee of Del Norte. Uh, Department of Health and Human Services Employment and Training Branch for six years this month. The learning curve and eligibility is huge. Trainees are often in the training unit ideally six months, but lately it's been more like two. And then are off, they don't have their buttons to actually grant cases for usually around a year. So it costs the county a lot of money to train each of us to become eligibility integrated case workers. Um, Retention is an important issue due to the cost of what it takes to train new workers. With the employees paying portions of our health package, PERS, union dues, etc., the remainder is left to pay household bills. Many of my coworkers are enrolled in the very programs we administer to the public. Many also work additional jobs to make ends meet when they should be home with their young children on the weekends. I have heard the Del Nort that Del Norte County is one of the lowest paying counties compared to other counties of similar size. I actually researched comparable incomes for the job that I do in um, four other counties. Um, Lassen County makes approximately 2,000 more annually. Um, Calusa County, $7,000 more annually for the job that I do. Amador County, $9,000 more annually. Glenn County, $15,000 more annually, and I'm sure this includes benefit packages. I researched um, the cost of living in Del Norte County is higher than in many of those areas. Our groceries cost more as well as gas prices. Rents are compar comparable as well. Um, I thank you for your time and your consideration. Um, the wor work we do is important. I'm passionate about it. I love serving others as well as many folks. I know they're here for homeless issues. We have many programs that help our local homeless folks. And it takes a huge amount of compassion to do the work we do. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Um, Paulette Enum, Del Norte County. Um, I'm here um, representing Karen Sanders of the Del Norte County Republican Central Committee. Um, she planned to come and read a letter to you and then give you copies. Um, she'll give you your copies later. But um, anyway, the Del Norte County Republican Central Committee supported Roger Gitlin, Lori Cowan, and Bob Berkowitz for districts one, two, and five respectively for supervisor during the 2016 election. We have reviewed the evidence and do not find sufficient cause for any of these recalls. If the petitions to recall are successful, the special election required would cost the citizens of Del Norte County approximately $20,000 per candidate with a minimum of approximately 43,000. These funds would be taken from the county general fund instead of being used for the betterment of our community. Therefore, the Del Norte County Republican Central Committee does not support the recall efforts against Supervisors Roger Gitlin, Lori Cowan, or Bob Berkowitz and the use of precious Del Norte County taxpayer funds for a frivolous election. Sincerely, Karen Sanders, Chairman, Del Norte County Republicans. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, Joan Miles, Del, Del Norte County. Um, I hope this isn't too off topic. I'm speaking up because I'm concerned about the fact that well-meaning people here in the community and in the country are now calling themselves socialists. They believe we need government to regulate our affairs and achieve social justice. They're not saying that people must be made equal, but there may be, there must be equity or fair share. They believe that the policy of helping people to help themselves is ineffective because many people can't help themselves. But the truth is 
that government cannot change the human condition, there will always be inequality among people. Anyway, the enormous, inefficient, wasteful government is more about power and control than about serving people. According to a number of black leaders, the government effort to achieve equity does not work. For example, Burgess Owens wrote, liberalism or how to turn good men into whiners, weenies, and wimps. Jason L. Riley wrote, please stop helping us. How liberals make it harder for blacks to succeed. I have a great article entitled Socialism and Political Atavism, and the rest of this is a, a review of that. The word atavism means of or relating to a former or more primitive type. Socialism is not modern. It is a cult of antiquity and 19th century mysticism. A lineage of Marxian ideas, for example, stretches back to ideas current in the Middle Ages and materialistic. But in Marx's earliest writing, the cleansing of the world of all that was corrupt and materialistic could only be achieved by violence. In, real, in reality, when revolutionaries following Marxian principles did triumph in Russia in 1917, the result was not a return to nature, but an intensified industrialization and urbanization. The inner core of the Khmer Rouge, which seized power in Cambodia in 1971, had absorbed the ideas of a primitive rural golden age. And in an attempt to realize these aims, the Khmer Rouge embarked <clears throat> upon a frenzied attempt to destroy modernity in which more than a million people were murdered in two years. Socialism in these and in many other cases is a reaction to a crisis. It offers a future of closed collective collective certainty of mysticism and mythology. In reality, the commune was a means by which rural landlords maintained their ideological control over the peasantry. Thank you, Joan. When the open policy no longer let's, believes let's in their own values and in individualistic morality, it will not fight to defend them and its destruction is easily achieved. F.A. Hayek has made the case that an economic and demographic divide has been crossed away from the closed economic system where a primitive collectivist morality was able to operate. To attempt to recross that divide has catastrophic consequences for humanity. Thank you, John. Good morning, my name is Randy Zog. <clears throat> I live in Crescent City. That's kind of hard Good morning, to follow up Randy. that little dissertation. Today I want to bring before the board a proposal to pro the permanent placement of two portable toilets at South Beach along Highway 101 in Delaware County. The intent of this uh, proposal, uh, basically currently there are no toilets at the, at the beach area, so as a result, for beachgoers to defecate or urinate in a roadside bush along the highway, often placing excrement into plastic bags, which I have personally picked up during beach cleanups. Use toilet paper with fecal material strewn in the bushes along the beach, including dirty diapers. The only recourse for our tourists and visitors is to drive to the harbor to use a facility that is approximately one half a mile away, which is hardly a solution. You imagine if you're there with your kids and everything, got to go to the bathroom, oh, let's stop what we're doing and we'll drive over to the harbor bathroom and use that. Not practical and not healthy. Um, so the tourists and the residents who currently are using our beach at South Beach and the surfers, surfers are huge for our economy here. This is one of the best surf spots on our north coast. They risk exposing themselves to toxic materials like E. coli, which poses serious health consequences. In addition, there are numerous runoffs, creeks, and streams along Highway 101 
like effluents that during the winter storms or high tides, LLE's materials are drained directly into the ocean, which in turn affects the entire health of our marine environment, our people that use the beaches, and animals that are at the beach. The, the impact of this is really out of control. I was on, at Friday I went down to South Beach, I did a little survey of my own. There was over 100 people at South Beach. So you can, <clears throat> excuse me, you can imagine 100 people that are sooner or later gonna have to use a bathroom and the only areas that are near there are the bushes along the highway. The, uh, it's, it, it, to say it's disgusting is putting it mildly. I've actually sent some pictures of some bags of, of a defecant that I've picked up, taken to Ted Ward over at, uh, at the uh, Dill North County Waste Facility. I think more than likely there is not one person in the environmental coalitions that would oppose this. I've reached out to the Surfrider Foundation, they're behind it. I've also reached out to a gentleman named Ryan Sunberg, he's with our North Coast representative with the California Coastal Commission. He referred me to what is called the Local Coastal Plan, which I am not privy to at this time, so I don't really know what's entailed in the Local Coastal Plan that would, in regards to placing porta potties at South Beach. So the bottom line here is costs, which is always a factor. I did a little research. I contacted a rotor router in Brookings, Oregon. They can place two portable toilets for $50. Not a problem. The monthly fees will be $220 for both units, which includes weekly maintenance and restocking of toilet paper. Obviously, for a week in between each week, you're going to lose a lot of toilet paper. At that point in time, I believe the county parks and rec can intervene, get a key. I already asked them about that. They can resupply the toilet paper, and that would be huge. So the total annual cost that I came up with is $2,640. In my mind, that's hardly a deal breaker to try to protect our environment, protect the people that use the beach, and protect our marine environment. The actual funding would, well, I'm hoping we could maybe get something out of general fund, but we all know money's tight. It may also come from the community development department, which we would have to uh, pursue further. There are negative impacts to anything. However, one of the biggest impacts I think we might be have is vandalism. Um, I did contact Rotorooter regarding this, and they will work with the county depending on a case-by-case -case scenario. Um, obviously, if there's continued vandalism, somebody goes in there, lights a fire, there's theft, uh, graffiti, it may result in the removal of those units. Um, it's kind of a gray area there. But at the same time, I don't really think that we need to dumb this down to the individuals who may ruin our porta potty toilets. That's an easy way out. I don't want to kick this can down the road anymore. We've actually had porta potties at the July 4th events. The units that uh, they can put in, rather than being unsightly, the green or the blue ones, they do have tan units that will mix in with the environment a little bit better, so they're not so you know obtrusive looking. Um, also, we do have police patrol along 101. I don't imagine the CHP or the county sheriff are going to stop at the porta potties every day to check the conditions of them, but at least we do have that presence. Um, and then in conclusion, um, I always do, I do a lot of beach cleanups. I don't wait for beach cleanups to happen. I do them myself, so does my family, a lot of my friends. It's a daily problem. Um, it is one of the most pristine beaches in the North Coast. And like I said, it's a well-known surfing spot. I, I know uh, some, I befriended quite a few people in town that are surfers, including the local boys surf shop, and they are behind us 100%. They're, they have indicated they have seen fecal material in the water when they're surfing, which is, is not conducive to any kind of a decent health to us or in our county. And then ensuring the safety of beachgoers and preventing exposure to toxic material is paramount. By placing these units, we can show our commitment to a healthy coastline. Thank you very much. Thank you, Randy. <laughs> yeah, what he said. <laughs> Hi, my name is Skylar Renwick. I am a property appraiser for Del Norte County Assessor's Office. I'm here today to draw attention to the discrepancies between the wages of my position and other comparable counties in California and within our county itself. Currently, I am the, the 
lowest paid property appraiser in the entire state of California. <clears throat> Although I am required to meet, I am required by the state to meet the same educational and training requirements of every other appraiser in California. My wages are 12 to 16% below counties with similar demographics. And I have some documentation for that. My position requires a four year bachelor's degree and extensive continued training and certifications. Yet I am also the lowest paid count, I am one of the lowest paid county employees with similar or even less strict job requirements. I am the only property appraiser in the county. It is extremely difficult to recruit for this position because it, pay, it pays the lowest in the state and the county has recently lost some appraisers because the current wage is not sustainable. How this translate is that now I cannot <clears throat> take the time to attend the trainings needed to increase my pay grade. Even with a step up in class, Del Norte County still comes in at 12 to 16 percent below comparable counties. I am a single mother with a college education and a full-time job. I should not have trouble keeping food on my table and the lights turned on in my home. I find it hard to believe that we can't close this gap even just a little to provide a livable wage for those of us just trying to be functional members of our community. Please take this into consideration when reviewing the budget proposal of my department and the recommendations of the union. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Skylar. Good morning. Good morning. So, you know, when they talk about their wages, let, let's break it down even more. When you look in the newspaper and you see that they want to pay you um, $1,200 biweekly, and you take, an, um, so that's $600 a week, you take your 40 hours a work week and you uh, divide that. That's probably not, that's barely $10 an hour. That's outrageous that these people aren't getting paid. And they're right, every other county except for this county is paying far more. But yet, you all find money to go on your extravagant trips to Japan. Think about that. Thank you. Thank you. Morning. Jesse Salisbury, Crescent City. I was going to write some notes down, but my Richard and Nia for City Council pin failed me. Um, in answer to this young lady back here, um, labor and resources create all wealth. It's the fact that, you know, corporations or, or, or the I'd say the top, the top uh, one percent, um, they're not sharing the wealth. Uh, you know, it's the income inequality, and it trickles down to cities, counties, all the way down to these people that are making 16 percent less than any other county in, uh, in California. I would like for the county to come back with a list of what our people make compared to the other counties. I think that it would be an eye-opener for the citizens. Um, I know that uh, it's really hard for us to keep a lot of positions here. I mean, we can't keep doctors here, we can't keep cops, we can't keep sheriff. Uh, and you know, everybody's running on a skeleton crew because uh, nobody wants to come here and then, and that just burns everybody that is here out. I mean, they're making so much less and yet they're doing even more work. Um, I love the idea about the, uh, the, the, the porta toilet out there at the beach. Um, I, I think maybe we could maybe look into uh, one of those, like a, a parks composting toilet. So then, I mean, they're made out of concrete and they're not lighting them on fire because you put a, you put a plastic toilet out there and they're going to light it on fire. I mean, it's just going to happen. It's really going to happen. Um, I, I really would like to see uh, that idea happen out there and maybe we could use it in some other places. Uh, I know that um, McDonald's bathroom gets a lot of use because of all the homeless that live behind, uh, behind there. And uh, 
and it's really not fair for the couple of businesses that do open their bathrooms to the public that they're you know having to turn a blind eye to a lot of the problems of their and um, thank you I wish I had more notes thank you Jesse okay Good morning. Again. Eileen Cooper. Hi. Um, I think South Beach needs porta potties. Um, I also, uh, our beaches are so crowded. Uh, also, what do you think happens at um, Point St. George? Uh, we've gone all these years with um, a so called wish list out there, management, and we don't have one porta potty. Look at how those pack that packed parking lot. We don't have any arrangement for people out there. Not even one. So our goals, recreational goals committee needs to get busy on these things. And um, I, I I would like to see you take up a porta potty at at the Point St. George as well. Uh, God knows what goes on there also. Um, and we have rare plants out there, you know. Anyway, um, also about um, uh, the pay scale. I think it's a good idea to do um, an assessment w um, with other rural, smaller, you know, counties and communities like ours. Um, I've always thought that um, in, that people should be fair to each other. Um, I don't really see any one person's best effort being less worthy than another person's. Just because you haven't had an education, you may do it. Your job is probably just as valuable wherever you are if you do a good job. And I don't like seeing the pay scale difference between our upper echelon here, making close to 200,000. I don't want to point out certain people, but our top people, I'm not saying that that's fair or not fair compared to other places, but they're at close to 200,000, and this other person is way down below, all the way down there. How many times more is that? I think we should be more fair to each other. Everyone's best effort is, shouldn't be that differently rewarded. That's, I, I, I'm more of a democratic socialist. I believe we all get together and decide that we're going to treat each other fairly. And we're going to not give this huge gap between the highest and the lowest. That's, that's what democracy democracy is about that we treat each other fairly and equitably thank you thank you there's an old saying anything that the government wants to destroy it subsidizes by the way I love these earphones I can actually hear people um, one of the things I think that would be the biggest help if you're trying to raise wages is to get more businesses in here. You don't have a good tax base. You don't have a good income. Um, I would, one of the things I thought about years ago is if you want the community to look good, people come in, they want to paint the house, it'll look better, right? Makes the town look nicer. Why not give them a tax credit? Maybe equivalent to the cost of the paint. Um, there's a lot of other kinds of things that you can do that would be incentives that maybe don't cost anything at all. Um, and bringing businesses in, going out and telling people where we are, telling them what we have to offer. Um, we've got that beach out there. Uh, I made a list of about 60 things that could be done and I've tried to give it, a couple of supervisors have seen it. But basically what I always get told is, well, go see somebody else. Well, I kind of gave up on that. But there are a lot of things that can be done. Don't cost anything. Um, one of the things was, I'll be real quick if I can, um, open up 
the first of June. My dates are just guessing, okay? First of June, wow, Crescent City is open for business. What are they doing? Well, they're going to teach how to make sandcastles at our beach. Well, what does that do? It brings out all these people from, you know. I would say you have four times during the year where you have these uh, uh, educational seminars. People come in and they do that. You see on the internet all the time where there's gorgeous, gorgeous sand castles. Um, then people would come in, they'd do their lessons, and they'd learn, and they'd play, and they'd maybe get better at it. At the end of the year, you take pictures. Now, I also would suggest a clown college. People come, they bring their own things. Uh, and there's a ton of these things. Um, uh, camera places open up a, a room so that people can uh, sell cameras and film and things like that. Well, in the beginning you've got all these little things going on and like I said there's about a uh, about 60 of them. What would happen is the people who have cameras would be taking pictures, okay? That's part of their learning to use the camera. At the end of the year you have a contest and what they win is the ability to be the top 13, get to be the front of the calendar and 12 months of the year. And on that uh, calendar are all the events that happen in Crescent City. People are gonna buy that calendar at the end of the year or whatever. Their picture may be one of the months. There's tons of things that can be done. Bring people here, bring money here. I'm out of time. Thank you. Good morning. Um, <clears throat> I have an idea. I'm here for the homelessness. Kate? It's for the Kate. record, state your name. Yeah, Kate. Thank you, Kate. Um, so I live up by Pebble Beach, and I'm watching a lot of Airbnbs coming, coming into being. And I had a guest coming into town, and so I had the opportunity to kind of look through the Airbnbs in town. I hosted a schizophrenic man for almost a year at my home. I provided a place for him to sleep. I fed him. I gave him money whenever he asked, $5 at a time. He was willing to share with us his, um, I think it must have been his food stamps. Um, he put our address down with social services so that he was able to receive um, support. So I have a lot of interest in homelessness and how to help our schizophrenic community, our people who are on drugs. And um, I was really observing. I, I, I called him my one. I said, I can help one. I can't take on the community, but I can do this. And I was really observing, like, what is schizophrenia? What, um, what can he do? What can't he do? And I discovered a lot about that. But in the end, as we were giving him, he had, we had his $220. We broke it into fives. Um, <clears throat> it's my estimation that what happened was, as he got more and more comfortable, he started using drugs. And maybe he was using them all along, but he became violent. And um, so we had to eject him off the property and what I did was I had blankets and pillows and he could sleep there every night in the carport. Now we're coming up to winter again and my heart is invested in people not sleeping in the rain and the cold and the wind and how to provide a place. So my thought is, are the Airbnbs being taxed? And, and this is obviously a privileged, more, you know, more of a privileged community in our community who has the money to, you know, have, some of them have several, and they're making money from, you know, the outside people who have money. So would it be possible for us to resource that in a tax through the community to provide some kind of winter shelter? I think um, a mistake if I were, you know, I don't know how this is going to go for our William again. Um, this winter, my husband is just saying we can't because he was damaging things when he would get upset. And of course, you know, I don't think he would harm us physically, but he was talking that way. So, um, however, 
as a human being and as a, a, a functioning member of our society, I think that a solution could possibly be made with the taxation on our Airbnbs and perhaps people who have multiple ones say, hey, you have, well, I guess if we just do one at a time, they all pay. But um, could we put together some kind of a shelter? Because I just honestly feel that we degrade our community when we don't take care of the ones who cannot take care of themselves. And I am telling you, William cannot take care of himself. The drugs is one thing, and that was our cutoff point, but the truth of the matter is he doesn't function, he cannot work, he needs somebody to take care of him, and he's, he's at least gets a shelter like a dog. So um, those are my comments. Thank you, Kate. Thank you. Good morning, Mario Fernandez. Uh, as it was just brought up, we are going to be encountering the winter months here soon. You do have a sizable population of homeless here in Del Norte County. And as it's been pointed out in the past uh, by, by leaders on this board, it is an emergency situation. And so I would like to propose to you all that the, the state legislature, the California budget was passed and approved back in June. <clears throat> and part of that was $250 million for one-time assistance for emergency needs for homelessness. And there will be grants coming out. Uh, I believe one of them is called HEAP, Homeless Emergency Aid Program. Now that's something that this, this county, this region could participate in. And I haven't read or heard anything about that, at least from this county or its leadership. And I would like to see more of that. I would like my members from SEIU 2015, they have personal involvement, they have issues around the homelessness here in the area, and they would like that to be addressed, whether it's through tiny houses or some shelter. But you have the power to make that happen. And I would like to work collaboratively with you to make that happen. I would like to work with the community here today to make that happen. So thank you. Thank you very much. The answer to that question is no. Supervisor Howard, in your capacity... It's okay. Please. Supervisor Howard, in your capacity as chairman of the Del Norte County Board of Supervisors, you have defamed and falsely accused me of being unethical. Sir, you owe me and the constituents of District 1 a public apology. At the July 24th supervisor meeting, you publicly stated that I was in violation of AB 1234, you were and are wrong, and at that time you attend uttered those falsehoods. You knew such statements were categorically untrue. For the benefit of all present, and for those viewing now or later. Please, let him finish, thank you. Please. AB 1234 is state mandated ethics training. I am and remain in full compliance of AB 1234. When I attempted to correct your misrepresentations, you cut off my microphone, a common practice you have engaged in over your past 18 months of disappointing and dishonorable service as chairman. Your defamatory statements further stated that I was unethical in my public opposition against the legalization of recreational marijuana. Such opposition rooted in my oath to uphold the Constitution. Marijuana, aka cannabis, is and remains federally illegal. Your continued down this path of libelous statements per your response to my letter to Managing Director John Costa at Western Communications, owner of the triplicate, where I, and I alone, called for the resignation and removal of the, the, its editor, Robin Fornoff, for what I termed unfair, biased, and prejudiced practices. Your letter of disassociation was not based on any written communication with Mr. Costa, or Western Communications. U.S. Chair instructed Chief Administrative Officer Jay Serena to compose a letter that via violated administrative policy as outlined in Rule 5, Paragraph E2, 100.050 of the Administrative Manual, which states all supervisors must be addressed by the word supervisor before their last name. 
And in the letter to Mr. Costa, you intentionally deleted my earned and elected title supervisor twice. You displayed this irresponsible and malicious rhetoric during the opening 60-day recall effort against me, an effort that has never even gotten out of the gate for lack of required signatures. But your malicious intent was there and clear. For your actions, you have deliberately exposed the county to risk and possible litigation. Engage in a thoughtful process right now, Mr. Chairman, for the benefit of our community by mustering up some character and publicly acknowledging the required retraction and apology, a protocol of which I am advised I must request as a predicate to any legal redress I may seek and recover for my damages. I demand that you place this on the August 28th agenda, the public apology to Delnor County District 1 constituents and Supervisor Roger Gitlin for your culpable slander and libel. Thank you for your comments. Any further public comment? Okay, we're gonna go ahead and bring it back to the board. You've already had an opportunity, Felice, I'm sorry. Yeah. It's, it's okay. You know, if, if you uh, didn't comment during public I comment, just, please. Uh, everybody probably knows this, Felice Pace from Klamath Glen. But when you're a public figure, you know, slander and libel, it's off, awfully hard to get. So let's not be intimidated by this. Thank you. Thank you. I should say by this display. Let's not be intimidated by this display. Thank you. All right, we're gonna bring it back to order and uh, move on to item number 19, which is our 1020 timed item list on homelessness in Donut County, presented by Michael Thornton, uh, leader of the True North Organizing Network. Good morning. Good morning, I, um, may I kick it off? Sure, <laughs> you don't look like Michael Thornton, but please, doctor. And you nailed it, I'm not. <laughs> And, and we have a slide. I think they're bringing it up right now. Okay. As you all know, I'm Kevin Caldwell, and I'm here this morning as a fellow Del Norter. I'm not, I'm not wearing any of my other hats. We're all fellow Del Norters together. And I want to introduce the Del Nort Homelessness Local Organizing Committee. We've been meeting for the last 10, 11 months and we want to present some of what we found out in that time and then i'll be back at the end for the ask which which i think is going to be an easy one which just getting your support for going on with this process okay i think we're all we'll kick up. it off um, my name is Brittany reimer and i'm the community food program director and I work at the Family Resource Center of the Redwoods where we have Pacific Pantry, a food bank in Crescent City. And we serve approximately 400 families per month, about 12% of whom are homeless. So through working with the food pantry, I've really come to understand how large of an issue homelessness is for our community. I've been motivated to work as I can to help get a movement started for addressing homelessness. If we can go to the next slide. Do I just? It's on the yeah. mouse right in front of you. Okay. Uh, there you go. So we've come together as a group and formed a vision and a mission around addressing homelessness within our community. And our vision is to move from managing homelessness to ending homelessness in Del Norte County. Currently, we're in a reactionary mode where we're really spending a lot of resources just responding to homelessness. And we're looking to move to identifying and implementing solutions so that we can end homelessness in our county. Our mission is to create a community-wide partnership that designs and implements sustainable solutions to homelessness. So we understand homelessness as an issue that touches all facets of our community, and we believe that it will take a community-wide collaboration to truly respond to homelessness in the way that is needed. We have a set of values that our work is based upon. The first of those is supporting human dignity and these values in the one page handout that, have you all been given that yet? Mm -hmm. Okay, so those are um, explained in longer form in the one page handout. 
um, for supporting human dignity, believing that all humans have equal intrinsic worth, addressing the core needs that uh, create homelessness. Again, we're looking to end homelessness, not just respond to it. Fostering hope, we believe that our community truly does have a plethora of resources that if we harness them, we have hope of ending homelessness in Del Norte. Empowering individuals, we're focused on creating growth-focused opportunities so that individuals who are struggling with homelessness can grow. Community-wide investment, again, this is a problem that touches our whole community and needs our whole community to respond to it. Unwavering proactive action, uh, with so many homeless residents of our county, the time to act is now. And sustainable solutions, so we're looking to create solutions that will last for multiple generations to come. Good morning, Mike Tompkins, warden at St. Paul's Episcopal Church. I could tell you a lot of stories of coming to church on Sunday morning early and finding somebody sleeping either on or behind the breezeway between our buildings, but I'd rather tell you a, a more specific story. This is of a 78-year-old homeless veteran. That's heartbreaking just in itself, just that one sentence, but this man had built a campfire in the back yard of our church, the sheriff called me at one o'clock in the morning and said, what would you like to do? He had been sleeping on the beach that night, but he couldn't sleep because he kept getting bothered by other people sleeping on the beach. And so he had been told by someone, we'll go to St. Paul's Episcopal Church. They're safe. That's a safe place to sleep. That gives you some sense of the scope of the problem. Now, this is a problem that the Methodists have that the Lutherans have. These are, tr these are churches I know personally have these problems also. Foursquare right next door to us. All of them have this same problem. And this is a burden that us churches can't solve. We don't have the resources. I mean, there's a lot of churches in this community that want to solve it. They can't by themselves. It needs, as we pointed out, the whole community coming together and bringing all of the resources. And um, let's see if I've missed anything. Um, no, this, that's, that gives you a sense of, of the kind of things that we deal with on a regular basis. A lot of property damage, a lot of cost and time and money. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Jill LaPelle and I am a resident, and I'm a resident of Crescent City. Did I miss it? I did. Can I take this back? Thank you. Uh, this is the scope of the problem. Uh, uh, firstly, um, State Senator Mike McGuire has stated that Dalnault County has the highest per capita homeless rate in the state. We have as many as 500 homeless adults in our community, and the Dalnault School District says that there are 156 homeless students and that number is trending upward. Homelessness affects all segments of our community, including the business community, law enforcement, and health care. According to our research, Sutter Coast Hospital received 495 ER visits from homeless residents in 2016 and 635 in 2017. Well, we've got plenty of our supervisors and our city council members here who uh, agree that the need for a community-wide effort is not a new idea. And there are lots of exciting ways that we can begin to address homelessness in our community. Here I want to highlight just three initiatives that are underway in other communities across the nation. The first one comes to us from Utah, from Salt Lake City. It's a housing first approach. And the core of this approach is the idea that before issues such as mental health or addiction can be overcome, you have to first be housed. You have to first have a safe place to sleep at night. And so Utah has taken this model and rolled it out across the state and has reduced the homelessness population to a number that's around 150 for the whole state. 
So police literally know the homeless in individual towns and cities by name. It's been an extremely effective model that now uh, California is copying with the no place like home that's being rolled out across the state. The idea that first you have to have housing and you wrap services that address addiction and mental health around that housing. And this is a, a proven way of addressing the core needs of homeless residents. Another model I want to highlight is from Portland, the Dignity Village model. So for this model, low-income housing units are built together in a type of a village community layout where the residents then are expected to, required to work within the community as a form of rent payment. So Dignity Village has an art studio where village, uh, village members are creating art and selling it. They have cafe. Um, it's the type of model where you are working for your rent and generating income through that to help pay for the cost of the establishment and it's also through that job training another model to highlight is um, the collaborations that are happening between churches and hospitals. So this one comes to us from Milwaukee, Oregon, where healthcare providers in the area have seen how much ER visits from the homeless population has cost, and they've invested some of that money that they were previously using just in response into collaborating with churches, where churches put up low-income housing units, small units on the church property, and the hospital is able to send caseworkers when they discharge homeless residents to those units on churches they send a caseworker to provide mental health addiction services and in that way they're not just discharging homeless re homeless residents right back to the street where they will then quickly end up back in the ER again so there's so many exciting ways that we could take this and what we're looking for today is really just to to start to say okay what works for Del Norte to get the community to come together and begin addressing this issue in a way that really matches the unique needs of our community okay <clears throat> hi again so as you can see there's many good ideas out there there's many many interested people out there to make this move we're optimistic that this time things are going to move quicker because we do have a whole organizing committee behind us that their only job is to keep the community working together and moving forward. Proven strategies like this collaborative innovation process. But I'm optimistic things will move forward this time. So for the ask. <laughs> First ask is pass a resolution stating that ending homelessness in our community is a priority for the Del Norte County Board of Supervisors. And number two, dedicate staff time and resources to participating in a community-wide initiative that designs and implements solutions to ending homelessness. And with that, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you for that presentation. Before we have board comment, I'd like to open it up for public comment on this issue and topic. I think we could do a lot more for the um, homeless situation that we have. Um, uh, I know we did have um, uh, McGuire support and um, a committee, I remember, getting together to try to get a, a shelter and it seemed like we were making progress but then um, we kind of um, drifted and so I'm really glad to see this um, organized effort come together. Um, I, I, I watch videos, um, documentaries on homeless situations um, in various areas, um, and yes, um, home, providing a home is the first step that is needed to getting a, a job, to getting help, and, and, and proper support. I, I think we could use um, uh, a small community like we see up there. And uh, I hope you make progress.
progress towards this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Other public comment? Hi. <laughs> Hi. So um, what it's I Kate, correct? Kate, yes. So what I discovered was that I don't even think that William would have the capacity to maintain a, a, a tiny house. So I think there is a difference maybe that we could identify between providing shelters and there are those who become disenfranchised sometimes by their own hands and sometimes just by their circumstances. But um, maybe we could differentiate between just temporary, where are they gonna sleep at night? Where are they gonna hang out when the rains are driving? For the ones who aren't able to really be more community members. And I think that out of that 500, 600 and some you know, people in our community, there are many who would benefit from a tiny house community. Um, my background, I'm an architectural and landscape designer, so I understand about bringing in ways to help people move through their lives more efficiently. But I think if we just provide some temporary shelters so that they have a place to stay dry at night, and it probably would really help with having them not in the hospital. Um, William came and he was sick with the flu and he had all of his sickness right in our carport and we supported him and he begged us not to take him to the hospital because they would have put him in a psych hold and probably give him medicine. He didn't want that. So anyway, I'm just saying whoever you guys are, I want to know you and, um, <laughs> um, and I just think that as we really say we're going to open our hearts and we're gonna, we're gonna reach out with what resources we have to take care of our community members, I think that's really a big step for us. I'm new to this community, I've been here only two years, but I really see that we are such a small community. If we open our hearts, the people who are in the, the higher echelon as far as the, um, their income base, then I think we have so much opportunity for change and to create an amazing mecca of healing here in Crescent City. So, thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Willie Lucero. I'm a Del Norte County resident, homeowner, former business owner. And I come here this morning because I have a moral obligation. It was only recently that I became aware that there were homeless children in this community and that is simply intolerable there's no way we can excuse that away the sins of all the fathers should not be brought upon these children and it was out of that motivation that I joined with this group in the late phases of this organizing group to address this issue and I personally know that I can do something. And I think that with the right attitude of presentation to our community members, no matter the varying differences in political affiliations or um, economic structures, everyone can do something. And then with an educated organizing group, those efforts can be implemented. And it, the time is now. These children should not be suffering with no home and with crazy parents and drug-riddled situations. They should somehow be housed and whatever services can be given to their parents should be given. You know, the foster system can't handle all these extra children. I'm not saying take them from their parents but somehow their parents need to be helped to step up, but the children need to be housed. It's that simple. When we become adults, we make choices, we fall down, we make poor choices, and somewhere somebody helps us. So it behooves us to be that somewhere where somebody helps us. Thank you. Thank you. Jesse Salisbury, Crescent City. Um, <clears throat> as, a, as a 
cost-saving measure alone, um, we really need to do something. Um, you take into consideration the money that we spend. What were they saying? 600 people, homeless people, went to the hospital. I listened to them on the radio, and they're going there, faking whatever injury. Some of them even injuring them themselves just to get off the street. Uh, then we have the uh, city PD and the sheriff's department. They don't have any place to put them, but it's just a constant. The police have to, you know, they get a call, the police have to go out there, they have to go out there. They have, I mean, they, they're just running them ragged. Um, <clears throat> I think that a, a safe, well-regulated area, um, I'm thinking behind Safeway and I'm thinking maybe, maybe we could start with something like the, uh, you know, uh, um, shipping containers like they did down in Arcata. Uh, you know, that you can take one of them shipping containers and split it up into five units. And that was like a, 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 a big success. Um, people were going in and right out of there because all they needed was a hand, some, some place that they could be and get their stuff together without having to worry about losing all their stuff. I mean, it's like a full-time job when you're living in the bushes behind Safeway not to have the vampires feeding off of you. I mean, it's just, I mean, and in, and if you're in a in a, if you're in a safe, well-regulated area, um, then then crime isn't so easily uh, feeding off of those those homeless people that are already downtrodden and and weak. Thank you. Thank you. For H.A. Pace from Klamath, I just want to urge you to uh, act on both of these. And I, I, I wonder how many people in the audience share that, that we want them to act on this today. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Jesse Davis in the county. I just thought this would be a great time to form a citizen-based working group. I think working groups have a proven track record of uh, creating results um, with complex community issues. So similar to the cannabis working group, there could be a community citizen-based working group to solve problems of the homeless. Thanks. Thank you. Please. Good morning. Phil Hilger, Crescent City, California. Been here since 1960. Number one, uh, you know, I have to be a realist about this whole situation. And the number one problem is, is you're not going to do away with homelessness. It's going to happen. There are some people out there that want to be homeless. You can say, no, you don't, but they choose to do that. We all have choices, and we do it. I just spent last weekend down the Mission District in San Francisco, and Bayshore Drive in San Francisco. And to hear somebody say that Delaware County has the highest homeless rate of the state of California is a fallacy. It's not true. There's more people down there on Mission District than there is almost in the whole city of Crescent City. They're lined up on the street, but they have a priority. They have things that they must do. They come there, and they have protocols they must meet. They have counseling they must do. They have to give up their drug. They have all kinds of good things, but if they don't meet that criteria, then they're out. Same thing with Bayshore, you know? And as far as resources and stuff go, Donut County's strapped as it is, you know? We've got tons of stuff to do. We can't, I mean, how many resources are you going to give to homeless we need to make the homeless responsible for themselves a little bit. And I'm a pretty liberal person. But you have to make them responsible with well, you know, as well. You have to say, okay, you know, we're going to implement this program, and you guys help us out too, which some of them do. I've helped them out. You know, and the churches help them out. And we're saying, well, let's build homes for them on the church's land. Well, we don't have that kind of land. You know, maybe we do. There was out there on Parkway Drive, if you don't remember, if a lot of people don't remember, out there on Parkway Drive, right there by Addie Needham, we were talking about that three years ago, about building a homeless shelter out there. 
went up to vote on, you know, and the people in District 5 voted it down, you know. So you have to be kind of careful of everybody has something they want done, you know, and I understand that. And everybody, you know, and even in the Constitution, right for liberty and, you know, happiness and all that. We all get it. But the thing about it is, is that sometimes you, you can't do just one thing. You have, it, it takes time to do it, you know? And if you go ahead and, and yeah, I'd love to give one homeless person a house and get them off the street, you know, or give them a meal, I have. But the thing about it is, is that they have to help themselves as well, you know? And as far as resources in the county, I don't think it's a priority. I really don't. I mean, we've got other priorities that, in Delano County, and you guys well know this, we've got other priorities in Delano County that exceed it. And I, you know, I don't want to beat the bad guy, but I'm just a realist about what goes on. Thank you, Phil. You're welcome. Linda Sutter, 5th District. Two years ago, I, I did complete research on the tiny villages, and, um, and I tried to present it because I was invited to this, I don't know if it was a mental health organization or whatever over here on whatever street, I can't remember. But um, I had several pages of what it would cost to have tiny villages uh, put up, and the place that I had this suggested was um, over by the juvenile um, hall. There's that old school or something there that would have been uh, good for it. And I came up with cost and everything, and Mr. Gitlin was there that day, <laughs> Roger, and said, oh, this isn't on the agenda. We don't want to hear it. So. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's the way it went and so I'm glad to see that you guys are starting this back up again and taking it a little more serious because it, it could be cost effective it could be um, um, self-contained where they take responsibility for cleaning up their own areas the places in uh, Portland and other places throughout the United States that have these tiny villages uh, it, it's proven to be uh, done well and it's and for, as far as law enforcement and hospitalization and all that so you should really consider it into doing something like that thank you thank you good morning good morning Hilda Yepis Contreras and I don't like speaking in public but I felt I had to today um, open door Del Norte and board, two, board, two North board member. And um, we've been talking about homelessness for years now. Um, I remember my first uh, meeting with um, True North when it first was in, it, in its inception. I was so excited because we had clergy people and we had p politicians there. And one of the things that we, the first thing that we talked about was um, homelessness and it really, I think really broke my heart because a lot of the Del Norte people um, there were saying, well, we really don't care about homelessness and we don't want it there because if we build something, they're all gonna come. And one of the clergy people said, but they're here already. And it was just, I don't know, it was just really eye-opening for me. And um, I think that it, we help homeless people throughout the year. We give them um, sleeping bags, tarps, um, hygiene stuff throughout the year. And so, but we can't sustain it by ourselves. And I think that it needs to be a community effort. I think that we do need to form com a committee with city and county and, and health because all these people have either mental problems or health problems. And I think that we need to take that into consideration the whole thing and um, and I really look forward to working with everybody to end homelessness thank you thank you <laughs> any other public comment today 
Okay, we're going to go ahead and bring it back to the board. Um, doctor, are you going to be the representative today for... Okay, can you please come back up? I'm, I'm, I don't want to feel like we're just speaking to the crowd. I'm sure many supervisors would like to make comment today. Just make sure that we're giving feedback to the right person. Sounds good. All right. Um, please, Supervisor Gitlin. Well, first of all, Kevin, <clears throat> great job. And I wholeheartedly support both resolutions. And I totally embrace everything that which you say. Phil Hilger, are you still here? Yeah. yeah. You mentioned in San Francisco, which I just returned from, in many, many, many parts of San Francisco, it's almost unlivable. And, but they must do this, and they must do that. But they're not doing it. So you have the conditions continuing to endure in San Francisco. And yes, right next to Dignity, Dignity Village in, in, in Portland, there are incredible systemic homelessness problems that are not going away. And I keep asking myself this question, all these good things, why can't we solve this problem? There's one important component that is missing from your presentation. And Mike, I've talked to you about this before. You can make all the services available, housing you want available. And someone can pay for it, and absolutely. But it is not compulsory. It is not mandatory. And I know I've been in the bushes and I've talked to many of these people, and it's made up essentially of four different groups of people. Number one, mentally ill. Number two, drug addicted people. Number three, alcohol addicted people. And yes, a small but growing segment of people who've just fallen through the cracks of life. And the fifth group is criminals who prey on them. Until and when and if you do not compel services, in other words, we're taking you out of the bushes, you do not have free will, you are, you are subject and, and prisoners of your own vices, this will not change because the population homelessness is so transitory. It's 500 this week and a new group of people come up next week and you're just running through the system. You must make these services compulsory and mandatory. And if you don't do that, we're just spinning wheels, folks. And I want to see this thing go away too. And it is the most important problem in Del Norte County. I disagree with you, Mr. Elger, when you say it isn't. I think it is. And I said that publicly and I'll say it completely Again, this will take our community and continue to pull it down. Whether it's rampant begging on corners, it's okay, it's no longer it's omnipresent over at the Safeway Center, now they've moved up to Walmart. So now we're, we're following this population around. There have to be some laws on uh, aggressive panhandling, people holding signs out. And those of you who generously give of yourselves, and I appreciate Kate, what you just said, are you still here, Kate? And Kate says one, I wanna help one. And look how that one turned out. It's, it's, I, I bless you, Kate, for wanting to do this. Bless you. But can you as one person do anything that way? They need to be in a place where there's staff who can help them and get off this vicious cycle. Because uh, Mr. William, if that you refer, he does not have free will. He can't make a, a cogent decision on what's best for him and what is not best. So until you add that component, Mike, um, I think we're going to be spinning wheels, and Kevin, uh, I, I'd like to be on your committee. I'd like to contribute to what I can. I've said this to you before. Until and when and if we do that, I think we are just uh, going through a lesson of futility and continuing to address this problem. You may get some success, and then next week it's, I don't want to be out of the, I like living in the bushes. Leave me alone. I've been with the sheriff when they try to get extract people in there, and they, they say no. So the sheriff leaves them in the bushes to continue to do what they're doing, which is in many cases making a holy mess filled with all kinds of drug needles and all kinds of other filth and, dis and debris. You know that's what we do, we clean it up. But how do we prevent it? These people must be given an opportunity to be in a safe place with a compassionate society that says we're going to help you. And that is not voluntary, that is mandatory. Supervisor Berkowitz. Mr. Chairman, uh, this is a topic that's been batted around for about a week at the daily town hall meeting. One of the possible solutions that they came up with, this certainly does not solve the entire problem, but is a possible solution. And that is, we do have a facility here in Del Norte County. We do have a facility that could house the homeless. We do have a facility that could feed the homeless. We do have a facility that could educate homeless children. 
And that's available to us right now. We're talking about Borrow Boys Ranch. Now I realize that doesn't solve the entire problem, but we do have an opportunity for education up there as the school district has done before. We've talked about uh, the kinds of things that maybe health and human services could be involved. And you would say, look, as a condition for being there, you're not going to be accepting addicts of any sort, all right? Whether it's drugs or alcohol or any of the other kinds of addicts, if you don't make that commitment, you're not there. But if we can take those people who really want to change their lives and basically allow them to be able to have maybe adult education services along with child education services being right there in a community where they can be observed and they can be helped and you could have counselors that's maybe just one part of a solution that we might want to explore thank you supervisor um Gosh, there's so many things I want to respond to. Um, the numbers are great. Thank you. Um, I had the privilege, along with Supervisor Hemmingson, to sit with your group, and I like what you're doing. I know in the past we had coats. Um, I believe Supervisor Gitlin was part of that. I'm not sure what happened to that group or why it dismantled, but it kind of fizzled out. And they were all about doing something right now to um, shelter them in the winter and that, those kind of things. I can talk about a few numbers. I don't, you know, I, I don't say these comments to um, dilute what you're saying, but I also don't want to alarm people. I, I was looking at the same numbers that you came up with the hospital because I have the same ones from Carlos. And maybe go back in preference. I've been working on this project directly, weekly, with Senator McGuire since July of 2016. So um, those numbers, what we're working on right now, we had a meeting about on the 6th is that they're, um, we call them frequent flyers. So even though you see 400 and 600, they're, those numbers are a lot smaller because they're frequent flyers. And we're, um, I had a hot, like I said, a meeting with the hospital um, on the 6th and they're trying to get into their records. So we have a better idea because we really do need to know. Um, the homeless, the kids, I mean, that's my heart. They're not outside. When the school district does their studies, they, um, it's couch surfing. I'm not saying there's no children on the streets, but that 150, um, a majority, and I don't know the percentage, and maybe we can check into that, and I think I'm gonna call Christina when we get out, but um, that number got to told to me a while back, and I went, ah! And I was told a lot of them, they're couch surfing. So they are sheltered, but they're, they're not in their home. You know, it's still not a great situation, but at least to know, I want everybody to know that there's not 150 people just out on the street, or 150 children out on the street. Um, I sit on a group, uh, No Place Like Home. Like I said, I've been working with the Senator for quite a while on this. So I applaud you guys and I love to see that the community is together because we do have a lot of different resources that needs to come together. We up here in the county cannot solve this problem on our own. Um, you hear the uh, No Place Like Home and I want to explain that to everybody uh, to make sure everybody is, has a clear understanding of what No Place Like Home is because there is a lot of money that's coming down the pike in 2000, June of 2016. Um, it was passed and it was like 20 million or $20 billion and it's you know coming down to, um, it's primarily only for brick and mortar to the counties to build. It does not um, include financing for the um, services but we have a wonderful, wonderful um, Health and Human Service Director, Heather, who is great at having other, there's other funding sources that will come in to do wraparound services. At this point with um, No Place Like Home, it's for chronically mentally ill homeless. So it's not that solution. Someone said breaking it down into um, different areas. We have to do that. So No Place Like Home breaks it down for the chronically mentally ill and we've done surveys and um, we you know, have identified. Um, Supervisor Gitlin is correct. There's, there's three, I say there's three types. There's the mentally ill homeless that you know, we're really focusing on with No Place at Home. There's um, drug and other alcohol, uh, or alcohol and other drugs, and um, that is an issue, definitely. And there's definitely a percentage of people who just want to be homeless. I disagree when he says that they're all transient and they're moving through Del Norte County. We're in a very isolated area. They are not 
traveling that 80 miles. And there, there's not that influx like you'd see in San Francisco going right from one city to the other. Once they're up there here, they're kind of up here. They're not traveling as much. I was surprised about that highest rate because one of my very first meetings was um, in Ukiah in October of 2016. And Delmar County was such a little blimp, they weren't even talking about us because our homeless was so small. Um, Tony Self and myself was in, I don't know, we were in Sacramento in July, I think. And the same thing, um, we do have it, there is other counties that are smaller and there's definitely other counties that have more. I think it's just very prevalent. We're a small community. Everybody knows everybody's business. Let's just face it. So we all know what's going on, so it's definitely very prevalent. It's just, it's in our faces. And it's, you know, it's sad and we want to help them. I don't think there's a person in here that doesn't want to help somebody else. I'm a true believer and a hand up, not a hand out. And that's what works in Arcata. I've been down there with, um, oh my gosh, it just went right out of my head, down with the containers, with Betty. And I've, I've spent time down there, and they've done a great job in taking those containers and splitting them in health, but they have to work for it. They are services, there's things that they have to do, there's requirements, and it's really important. They have to be held accountable. We can't just house them and say, here, and with the no place like home, if that does go forward, that's exactly how it will be. It'll be housing and there will be um, services that they have to um, deal with and take and that type of stuff. There's something else that's going on that's kind of part of this, but it's a big win for health, uh, mental health. And that is we have mental health court now. How many people know that? Anybody know about mental health court? <laughs> yeah, it's an excellent program. It started in December, um, kind of like drug court you had issues and run into with the laws like we know all the, a lot of the mentally ill have, um, they have an opportunity to be held responsible and go to court and work that way. So again, we're holding them responsible because that is a key. That's hot, part of the prevention. Um, there's a lot of little things that are going on that it's very clear with some of the comments that people just don't know what's going on. And I think that's probably my fault or our fault of not you know, talking about it enough or letting you guys know um, but we are taking steps. There's so many more, much more work that needs to be done, definitely. And I am very appreciative of this group, and thank you guys all for coming up here today. Um, and I totally su uh, support a resolution, as well as forming a group. I said that a couple months ago. I think uh, Supervisor Hemmingson agreed with it, and we had a couple people from uh, the city council as well that sit on the homeless group with Senator McGuire that was also at that group. We all agree, we thought that was Coates, but it was made very clear that Coates, they, you guys want to start your new, and that's great, and we definitely support that. Um, it is going to take the whole community. Um, we can't do it alone. Where we're at, Tony, correct me if I'm wrong, the grant is being submitted next month? 70 for the? The this, competitive notice of funding availability has not been released for the numbers like home. Their anticipated release date is in the summer, so but now, Tony, could you come up and but the grant we're, we're we're doing the grant that's been submitted. We we're waiting on funding for the technical assistance to see what works for us. You know, is it a 12 unit system? Is it a 20 unit system? Is, are we going to build from the ground up? Are we going to renovate? These are all the questions that we're investigating right now and have been. We're talking to people. We're looking at what worked and what didn't. Because I'll tell you, they did something in Arcadia that, or in Arcata that didn't work. We don't want those problems up here. But they've done things in Santa Rosa that has worked. So we are checking out. I, I've talked to and seen, and we've also <coughs> talked to companies. Because Delmar County isn't equipped to run a facility. So we are also looking at companies that come in, like Catholic Charities, that run them once we set them up. So there's so many different steps to this, and we are looking at all of it. There's technical um, money that we got in to study that and have somebody come in. And at that time, I'm assuming they're going to talk to people from your group as well because they'll do a lot of interviews of what's going on. And we will do something that works for Del Norte County. You know, it's all about us up here. And we are different and we are unique. And we want to make sure it's working for us. So that's kind of where we're at. And then we'll go, there'll be, there's, you know, 500,000 funding right off the bat that's non-competitive. One thing that California did do, um, usually they throw money out there and it's just, we have to go up against LA and San Francisco. Um, they split it up this year. They did, or it, it's suburban, urban, and rural. So as a rural county, we will get our share, which is a 
plus. It's, it's something we're really excited about. It doesn't usually happen. So you know, there's a lot of good things out there too, but this isn't a quick fix overnight, um, the, no, how, um, the no place like home funding and that um, building and stuff. So I know there's still other needs. I know there's needs that you guys to talk about. We know that winter's coming, so whatever we can do to help. I hope I answered a lot of questions. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor. Supervisor Hemmingson. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, I agree with what uh, Laurie said. We've been working on this uh, for quite a quite a while, uh, and I have no problem with uh, passing the first resolution. The second resolution, to me, is a little troubling because it <coughs> it means that we're going to dedicate staff time and resources, at which you know is not too big of a deal if we have a limit on that. I mean, what are we going to take away from? We could we could devote all of our staffs, all of the time, and neglect everything else we do and still not come up with a solution. And the solution is what we want. And it's not going to be just one solution. As was pointed out, there's different problems with different homeless. So there's going to be different solutions. And, you know, nobody's come up with that silver bullet yet, you know, for that solution, uh, for I don't know if any of the issues. So, uh, and I'm certainly open to it. I can certainly dedicate, uh, I can promise my time uh, in a community-wide group that I would be more than happy to, to attend uh, meetings and be part of that. But I would have a problem, a little bit of a problem, with with just blanketly dedicating staff time and resources to, you know, to a solution that, that so far I'm not sure anybody's come up with. I mean, there's been a lot of things out there, uh, but we don't know what's going to work here. Um, so anyway, I'm, I'm there, uh, happy to, to help out all that I can. Um, uh, but, you know, I'm a little bit like Phil. I am a realist, uh, and I want to find real solutions. Thank you. Um, I do have a question, since you've gotten all these great comments. Um, is there any resources behind the, the group or committee that's currently formed behind this at this point in time? So, yeah, the True North organizers, you know, they, these are paid professionals. You know, paid through True North, which is a subsidiary of Humboldt Area Foundation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They get their money from California Endowment. Excellent. And so they'll be bringing those resources to the table besides just staff time. There could be some monetary type resources that become available depending on a discussion of a solution over time. Yeah. Still unknown. That's all, all a possibility. Great. The... Um, I think the biggest thing I'm hearing here um, from listening to all the supervisor's comments and comments from the public is that we're all in agreement that there is an issue here in Dillnar County and that issue appears to be growing and as that issue grows it becomes more visible and that conflicts with the direction of the overall community both from an economic standpoint to our businesses but also to our county government resources. And so how we wrestle with that is going to be quite the challenge, but it's been a challenge for many years. Going forward, what we need to ensure is that communication is taking place. And just listening to the supervisor's comments up here today and those of the community, and more importantly, those of the committee, um, open communication and transparency as that moves forward is going to be important. Whether it's a group that has started up and has tapered off, over time, that energy needs to take place. And the reason I asked about the resources type question, specifically towards staffing, is that oftentimes there's not enough energy or a champion or a leader in that group to continue that momentum going. And I'm, I'm extremely happy to hear that commitment from this group. Um, we certainly don't want to be working in the silo. And by the silo, I mean just Delnar County alone and the efforts of the city and the county under the No Place Home Like initiative that is uh, being spearheaded somewhat by our supervisors here next to us, but also by Senator McGuire. We don't want to be just working in the silo. And in order to do that, I think the initiative that I hear being discussed and some of the comments I've heard uh, made by uh, Jesse Davis in particular, having that working group um, not to tax the supervisors with more committees, but at the same time, having that communication all in one location so it's nice siloed is going to be extremely important. And if having a resolution helps get us there, which I'm, I think I'm hearing, I didn't hear one person up here on the board say, no, they wouldn't want to see us consider a resolution, in particular to, to resolution 
uh, number one that you have uh, on here. How we get to that next step, which is dedicating the resources, specifically staff time and county time, I think that would be a great point for a second discussion by the board on this particular issue. And I, I believe if there's consensus from the board today to actually agendize for our next meeting, if uh, the co organizing committee would like to help craft some language, what that might look like, there would be some consensus from this board from what I'm hearing to actually address a resolution at our uh, last meeting in August, if that is acceptable. Okay. Good. <laughs> so I'd like to uh, know from the board at this time if, if there's willingness to move forward at our uh, second meeting in August with some language considering a resolution on this issue. Mr. Chairman? Yes. I heard 100% consensus on option one. Of resolution one I heard uh, supervisor Hemmingson had some dis some honest disagreement with regard to option two is there some kind of a ceiling or or some kind of a, a, a factor we could put in there to to investigate the deployment of, of staff to realize goal number one goal number two seems to be a money thing a people thing an employee thing so I don't know how we can phrase that <clears throat> but I think it needs to be looked into to see what and if what kind of costs are involved in uh, could I, realizing could I uh, resolution one? Thank you, Supervisor. Wait, I, I look at that resources as a very broad sense of the word resources. If, if you don't have the staff person to do something, then you don't have that resource. So you, you can only give something that you have. So I, I'm, I'm thinking that resource, it's pretty benign also. Sure. So I, I think what we're hearing today and, and what this board's willing to commit to you, especially in particular on item number one on your ask, is that um, if you could, doctor, continue to communicate with our CEO, Serena, Jay Serena, uh, on this particular issue, that this board by consensus will move towards item number one with a resolution at our August 23rd uh -huh. meeting. Okay. And then uh, at that time, we'll continue to probably have some discussion specifically on item number two and how we might be able to integrate staff into that conversation, given some of the concerns expressed by supervisors. Okay. Okay. And then if Jay is the proper person to be communicating with? He, he would be. Okay. Supervisor Cowan. Dr. Caldwell, how often right now are you guys meeting? Once a month? Once a week. Once a week? Yeah. Ambitious. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay. Appreciate Thank everybody's you. time today. Thank you, guys. <laughs> We're going to uh, take a five-minute recess and uh, reconvene at 12 o'clock. Thank you for your time, everybody. See you in a few minutes.
and reconvene our meeting and move to our 1045 timed item, which is our cannabis update. I believe both Joel and Jesse will be here today to present <coughs> to us. Good morning, Joel. Good afternoon. Um, by one minute. <laughs> so um, I'm doing this update this time around because we are pretty close to done on a retail and manufacturing ordinance. The um, final draft from staff will go to the working group tomorrow, so they haven't seen it. But because we want to get this to the planning commission as soon as possible, we're going to kind of concurrently do the board, the working group, maybe the ERC, however it takes. So I want to run you through a lot of the um, kind of big picture ideas so that if you hate them, we don't waste time on the planning commission. Um, and so I got a little, a little PowerPoint here with some maps so you can see where we're talking about this happening. And I'll try to keep it fairly quick because it is getting late. Uh, the basic principle is a combining district. Um, it's a, a land use device that lets us put a zone over other zones. And what we're talking about is the Crescent City urban boundary. Um, it's a boundary that LAFCO uses to talk about you know, future water and, and sewer expansion. And it would basically say that in the C234 and M zones within that area, cannabis retail and manufacturing would be eligible to be done with a use permit. It would still have to be consistent with the underlying zones, those C's and the M zone. Um, and you'd have to get a use permit, so there'd be um, you know, a process for each one. But what the combining district does basically is it limits it to a specific area. So we're not gonna be in Smith River or in Klamath it's only going to be in the area where, um, actually, right here. You can see the, the orange outer boundary um, is kind of birch, then up um, kind of near uh, standard veneer there. And because it's, uh, we'll have better maps when we bring forward the real ordinance. So you can see them imposed. The next couple of slides are going to show you your C and M zones, but they won't have the urban boundary. So you kind of have to put them together in your minds a little bit. Um, because of our requirements of um, uniformity in our zones, if we were going to purely allow it in a C3 zone in one place, it'd be allowed in a C3 zone everywhere. And then we're dealing with setbacks and trying to control it from various uses or borders. And it creates a lot of opportunities to miss things and to have unintended consequences. So this approach picks the area probably best suited for retail manufacturing and only focuses there. In the future, it can be expanded. If in the future it needs to be contracted, this is a smaller area to contract from. It's a kind of a controlled startup here. Um, <clears throat> these are um, maps that the Warden Group has been looking at. You can see the red, the, the legend didn't come through, but the red is your C, your commercial, and the purple is your manufacturing. Um, so, you know, even though there was a pretty significant area covered, you know, most of the area is really kind of along North Crest and the 101, and then down off of Elk Valley. So these are gonna be the areas where if you have property, you can apply for a use permit. Um, here, there's you know, one more after this, but what the uh, red circles are is you know, an imaginary point in the middle is a school. The small circle will be the boundary for medical retail, and the outer one will be the boundary for adult use retail. So it's 500 and 1,000 feet. Um, the decision to make medical a shorter distance was um, largely to accommodate a, a particular business that is 508 feet from a school. So um, that is, is where the working group wanted to go with that. If that's not important to the board and you really want a thousand, we can accommodate that. 
Um, the manufacturing will all be a thousand feet from schools. No difference for uh, medical. And then the retail would be a thousand from each other. So we're going to limit the concentration, um, but not limit the concentration on manufacturing. So if there's a spot where manufacturing can all go together, it actually will keep it isolated and mitigate impacts that way. And then here's down Elk Valley. Um, I think that lighter paint color is commercial recreation. We're not looking there. We're also not looking at any harbor dependent commercial. It's C2, C3, uh, C4, M. Um, the way it'll work is there'll be a use permit process that looks the same for everything. And I'll get into that in a second, but you will still be beholden to the underlying zone district. So manufacturing is not a permitted use in a C2 or a C3 zone, but it is permitted in a C4 or an M zone. So those would be the places where you are eligible for a use permit uh, for manufacturing um, and, and kind of commercial works similarly. We're talking about a one year renewal. There's no vested rights to continue. And the crux of it is this operation plan, some version of which is required by the state for all of their permits. This will put all the necessary information in one spot for the county to look at it, see what's trying to be done and how to mitigate it. We're talking about where they're getting their water, where they're getting their power, how they're providing security and cameras, hours of operation, the size, all of these things so that planning can uh, kind of go down the list and require conditions and, uh, and mitigate harms. Um, then, you know, we'll have planning commission hearings where these plans will be public. People can come and look and see what's in their neighborhood and what they want to object to. Um, I covered these. Um, schools and daycare, um, 1,000 feet for adult use, 500 for medical. Um, the state regulations are actually 600 for medical, but we're allowed to go lower. So with full disclosure, this is less restrictive than that particular element in state law. And then 1,000 feet from any other retailer, make sure that we don't have kind of uh, a district or a row of um, cannabis retailers. With manufacturing, it'll be no volatile solvents. Um, so hopefully nothing that can explode. It's a lighter industry. And um, carbon dioxide and ethanol are considered non-volatile under the regulations. They do still pose some uh, increased dangers. So there'll be an extra finding by the Planning Commission that that particular operation uh, isn't going to um, impact the neighbors or, or be particularly dangerous. There will be certain findings that will have to go in every single one, every, um, every um, permit the Planning Commission issues. And so these are some of them. They'll have to comply with all state laws. So we basically incorporate state law by reference, and that's a lot of law. Um, every time they come out with draft, uh, new drafts, the regulations are more detailed to the point where it, it seems so onerous to operate, we might not actually have any functioning industry at all. But we would incorporate those in, in the use permit so that if you break state law, we don't have to wait for the state to enforce it. We can do that. And, um, you know, make sure that we're identifying and mitigating nuisances before they happen and not relying on extra expense later. Um, which will be inevitable, but we can at least try to limit that. Um, because we went round and round about what a church is <clears throat> and, and how to protect churches and which churches have schools and whatnot and parks and various things, the Planning Commission will make this finding that it's not going to uh, have reasonable foreseeable impacts on sensitive uses without really defining sensitive uses it includes but is not limited to. So churches, uh, government buildings, parks will have to be considered by the Planning Commission with findings on the record. And this will give neighborhoods the opportunity to show up and say, well, I think this building over here is a sensitive use and I think it's gonna have an impact and I wanna talk about it. And so the Planning Commission will consider and make this finding. It's not the hard rule that the thousand feet from a school is. So, you know, the public doesn't necessarily have as much security knowing it won't happen there, but they will have 
an opportunity to come and talk and the planning commission will have to make a finding that finding is appealable to the board of supervisors and ultimately the courts so it does provide kind of a compromise amount of protection between the two um, so that is it in a nutshell um, and so you know I'd love to hear questions or comments and if Jesse has anything to add um, we can do that whenever you want so I'll go at Supervisor Berkowitz. Thank you. The other day at the meeting, you talked about uh, road improvements. What kind of road improvements would be necessary for permitted agricultural operations on roads like Low Divide Road, for example? So that is um, <clears throat> really an ongoing discussion that will be part of the next ordinance. I think as you saw at the meeting, we don't have all the answers to that right now. With this ordinance, you know, there's not going to be road issues in the Crenn City urban boundary. It's all going to be on the grid. It's all going to be on sewer. So those impacts aren't really necessary to deal with now. Um, I, can, I can be prepared when we come back with uh, cultivation to have Rosanna or somebody who can really speak to the complexities of the roads issues. But, you know, the, the short answer is if it's going to happen in Timberland, on um, poorly maintained roads, then the permittees are going to have to make some sort of accommodation, some investment in those roads so that we can permit them. Okay. It's kind of looming down the road. The other thing that I heard uh, the other day was a member of the Cannabis Working Group said back in February that if the committee fails to make a decision by August, the ordinance can't happen by the end of the year. Now, I realize you're on track are we really on track to do this in August so that we can make the end of the year? I think we're on track, but let's make the caveat that <clears throat> we're not going to be done in December. Um, my goal has been to get retail manufacturing and some form of cultivation uh, to this board by the end of the year. Um, what I told the working group, which you heard, is to pick one element of cultivation and focus on making that um, a permittable use instead of trying to solve the whole thing at once. We're probably going to keep going and fine-tuning and expanding and contracting for a while, uh, but if we can at least say to the public, you, you know, there's retail, there's manufacturing, and there is some sort of cultivation, then I think the working group has been pretty successful considering. So if we're not done by the end of the year, what kind of implications does that have for the ordinance going forward? Um, there are, um, the, the, the impacted community, the immediately impacted community are people who are growing currently on a cooperative model that have to get state permits to continue to operate by January 1st. We don't know exactly who they are, what they're doing, or what they need to continue their operations. We're not exactly trying to tailor it to them. We'd like to have something workable and available so that they can do some kind of permitted use. Um, so beyond those people, there isn't really any implication. My kind of end date timeline where I really want things um, to be at least in place, even if they have to be adjusted later, have them really in place, is July of 2019 because that's when our CEQA exemption expires. Now our CEQA exemption lets us pass these things without doing environmental review if we're going to do environmental review on each particular permit, which we'd really do anyway because they're use permits, they're discretionary. Um, so if we can get the whole uh, regulatory framework in place that minor adjustments later aren't going to pose significant impacts then we can get by with negative declarations and things like that. Um, I think the working group has been pretty productive. It's slow, but it's slow when you do things by committee. When you do things in public, it's kind of slow. Um, we've talked about a lot of things. I think you're going to see things come together kind of fast because a lot of issues have been raised and discussed. I hope that this use permit is going to be a one-size-fits-all. And so um, this operation plan whatever it is you're doing, if it's cultivation or manufacturing, you'll put in these details and they'll be able to be assessed. So the only thing that really has to happen for the cultivation to work is to figure out where to put it 
and then what specific extra regulations. So in this ordinance, there's the use permit, then there's a section of specific regulations for retail, and a section of specific regulations for manufacturing, and a reserved section to put in the specific regulations for cultivation. Um, between all the things the state is going to require that we're going to have, you know, our biggest question is about things like those roads. Um, where in the county is best? What's important? Uh, what size? What I, I anticipate, what I hope happening, is that this probably goes to the Planning Commission either in September or October, and the cultivation is only one month behind. So it's either going in October or November, and then it's coming back, the cultivation ultimately back to this board. Um, that, that goal deadline that we put in the ban ordinance is that first meeting, I think it's the only meeting in December. If we can have something for the board to approve at that deadline, the ban can be repealed and Maybe we haven't had a complete, comprehensive, amazing, you know, future ordinance, but we have uh, the rudiments in place, we have the conversations going, we have the people invested, and we can fine tune and uh, edit afterwards. So one last question. Mm -hmm. You say that the working group has not seen this. So my question is, what guarantee do we have that even the working group will accept this program? We don't have any guarantee. They might hate it. Um, what this is is the general concepts that we've discussed. We discussed them to death, really, with the working group. So I'm anticipating the bones of this thing being exactly what they're expecting. But then when staff you know, looks at it and sees the things that staff needs, there's things in here we didn't talk about put a $15,000 bond in here. If you want a permit, you gotta get bonded. We never discussed that. I saw it in the state licenses. I, I boosted the, the bond amount because I think it's a good idea. There's other little things in here that are gonna say, oh wait, we didn't talk about that. And they might be things that make it harder to get a permit. Um, so maybe the working group decides they don't want it. And um, you know, if that happens, I guess we can have a conversation about whether the board wants to move forward with the ordinance without the working group's blessing. Or the working group set a goal of having um, consent, um, having unanimous consent on the ordinance, and maybe that doesn't happen. So maybe this may not majority. even be the last alliteration of this plan that the board is going to see. That is very possible. Okay. Okay. Any other questions for Joel? Any feedback? My only concern is that 500 for medical. I, I'm not sure how I feel about that. Well, I, I'm not saying wrong well, or right. Let me uh, lay out some of the, uh, the rationale. Um, one is the thinking that medical is going to have maybe a different clientele with less um, foot traffic and fewer impacts. And so maybe it doesn't need to be as far away. That, I have to say, is uh, not something I have any idea if it's true or not. That's kind of the thinking of, of voices on the working group. Um, to me, I don't know that medical is going to be financially viable. I think once people can do this and buy it without a 215 card, the number of people getting prescriptions is going to plummet. So I don't know if a medical business is going to really survive anyway. And then there's a particular um, medical business that's, you know, 508 feet away from a school. And, uh, you know, the, the proprietor came, you know, participated, made their needs and desires known, made the case for themselves, and the working group acquiesced, which is, you know, kind of the point of the working group is to provide that process. If this board does not agree with that, it's an easy change, right? You can just delete that. But, you know, as a matter of, you know, policy, that's where it came from. And I can let Jesse elaborate if, if he feels I'm missing something. Supervisor, Well, we're on that 
particular subject didn't you say the state requirement was 600 feet the state requirement is 600 feet unless the local jurisdiction says something else so how is the how is that facility able to operate now well right now they are not permitted they're operating I, I suppose under the collective model but they'll have to get permitted on uh, January 1st so this this is kind of tailored to give them a pathway to do that now there's no guarantee that they'll be able to meet other requirements there's no guarantee they'll stay in business there's no guarantee they won't you know, sell the property or I think their tenants the owner the might tenants. might change their mind so you know crafting an entire ordinance for one specific situation isn't ideal and I you know, tried to make that point at the working group but this is what and that I guess uh, is my concern and um, how long have they been in business um, a while quite a while I don't know exactly and there's no requirement how close these facilities can be to each other for the retail we made it a thousand feet so if you have one retail business there can't be another one it has to be a thousand feet away. It must be a thousand feet away. <clears throat> so that will control density. This Crescent City urban area probably if we didn't do that could support maybe dozens. But if you do put a thousand uh, foot in there, you know, you're limiting it substantially. And there is a, you don't have a cap number. <coughs> Excuse me. You don't have a cap number now. We didn't do a cap number. Um, I don't like cap numbers because then the government's choosing winners and losers. If you just have the the distance, we're hoping the market kind of sorts out who can make a go of it in that space. Well, my concern is right off the bat, everybody's going to be wanting to be one, I think. And so then you have failed businesses, and that concerns me a lot. I would rather see successful businesses if we're going to promote business. Well we could do the the rfp route where they kind of propose a business and then we develop really elaborate criteria for determining which business get them that kind of puts us in the position of knowing what makes a successful business it, you know i don't i don't love that idea it makes it you know then our fault if they fail a little bit we're the government and we've come to help right <laughs> Yeah, I, I'm kind of in agreement with you in, in the working group's analysis specifically behind uh, let the, the process work. Um, we've seen it work in Brookings with a reduction in retail outlets over time. Um, yeah, I, we might see a rush at the beginning, but there's only so much that this community can support, and the market will drive that at certain points in time. I guess the question I have for you following up on that let's say there is a rush to that is there anything specific within the ordinance that will address that cleanup of that site once if, well, if the business were to fail well there is the bond um, also the operation plan should give us an opportunity to know exactly what we're looking at and and have conditions ahead of time the other thing is you know if it's a retail operation and it fails then all you have is an empty storefront Manufacturing might be a little more complicated, but without the volatile solvents, we're looking at kind of a low intense industrial use. That becomes a much bigger problem when we get to growing, and now we have a, an abandoned grow site or something. So, you know, we will have to consider that then. I'm hoping maybe the bonding issue and, and, and mitigating these impacts. And if they're really following the regulations from the state and they're doing what we're told, they shouldn't be creating really messy things. There shouldn't be piles of pesticides and things that they leave next to the creek you know sure so. and then um, you just mentioned it I did have this on my list to discuss but signage um, it's my preference not to see any highway signage just uh, just the storefront and whatever minimal signage is, is possible um, how is that being addressed if it is at all right now it's not I think that's kind of a, a separate ordinance that um, we do plan to address on state law the permittees can't advertise on an interstate highway so they can't do anything on billboards on the 101 however that only regulates California permittees it doesn't stop people who have permits in Oregon from putting up billboards that say come to Brookings and buy pot um, you know and it gets really sticky when you start telling people what content they can put in an advertisement because you've got a lot of First Amendment problems. One thing I floated is the idea of just banning billboards, off-site advertising in general, which there is, 
it's something people do. You kind of have to get like a five-year amortization period where they wind down and, and, and get their profits. But that would be content neutral. You don't have to say no pot leaves on signs. You just say no signs, which a lot of communities hate signs anyway because they are kind of eyesores. As far as on-site advertising, there are in other ordinances in other counties restrictions on what can go in that sign. I don't like that. I don't know why they've done that. I don't really feel comfortable with that. But what we do is a sign ordinance that controls size. Um, most places, if they're in a shopping center or something, the center is going to hopefully dictate size and maybe the aesthetics a little bit as a private contractual arrangement. Um, but we decided not to tackle all of that here because it might be a bigger conversation about signage in our county in general. Well, as long as it's being tackled, I'll wait for the working group to discuss it, but it is a concern of mine and I'd like to see it addressed. Okay. Further comments for Jess or uh, Joel at this time? Okay, Joel, we're gonna go ahead and open up for public comment. Linda Center, 5th District. I had the pleasure of being invited to a couple of homes, and the message that I'm sent to here to tell you today is you guys have missed your mark on the retail. People are already um, growing phenomenal amounts of um, cannabis. Um, you know, six plants produces a lot. And uh, so they're basically what I mean to tell you is that it's too late, even no matter what you come up with the retail, because people are already in, making it for themselves and selling it amongst others. The second thing is, is in regard to, you know, I, I used to go to these cannabis meetings, but it goes in one ear and out the other, especially when I speak, of course. Well, whatever. But uh, yeah, this 500 feet uh, uh, in, by a school and uh, church. Uh, because this person has a medical collective. Um, you know, is that really down the road you want to go? Is that where you want to go? Is not even to accommodate uh, the, the state law of 600 feet away from the schools and churches and whatnot else? I don't care if it is medical. And hopefully what Joel said is true, is, you know, once, once we do get the retail going, uh, there'll be no reason to have a medical license anymore because you can just go out and get your medicine without having to pay for that license every year. So, you know, I guess you guys got some decisions to make, but oh, there's one other thing I'd like you to know. Uh, I, the C3 zone for manufacturing, I find that real interesting because especially on Elk Valley Road, what, what block is that in? Because I know Mr. Davis, he's got uh, property on Elk Valley and he's got property out on Low Divide for his growth. So I don't know, it seems like these, this, this group that you formed was for the benefit of themselves and not for the benefit of anyone else in the city or county. Thank you. Thank you. Public comment. Well, first and foremost, Phil Hilder again. First and foremost, I want to congratulate you on the working group for, you know, doing what you're doing. But number one and foremost, I wish it was never passed. I wish it had never been legalized. Because once you legalized it, now you've got to deal with the government. And the government is tough to deal now you've got all these regulations that you know you have to deal with and everything and i'm you know i have a medical marijuana card you know and i'm a firm believer in cbds i use them for arthritis and it works i can tell you that right now but the bottom line is is that correct me if i'm wrong and you were saying this uh, standard veneer site is that what you're saying well, that's right by the wildlife refuge. And there's houses, there's people that own property down there that can't even build a house down there because they're by the wildlife refuge. And, you know, is it going to be organically grown? Because in Humboldt County, they just had a big deal, and it's on the news, everybody knows it. It was on the news, and they had to reduce all their stuff on their shelves because it wasn't, you know, it didn't meet state regulations. So, What's it going to be grown with? 
you know, is there going to be a pesticide issue? And I know you address that, and I appreciate that. But I live out in that area, you know, and I have a friend who lives in Cave Junction that's lived there for 20 years on the Illinois River, and he's about ready to sell his property because it's legalized now and everybody's grown, you know. And I know that legalization is not an issue now. It's a done deal. But I'm just saying that you have to be careful on where and when it can be sold, you know. And the state regulations are going to override anything you do county-wise. I mean, it just happens. That's a real, you know, that's the real issue about the thing. And if you can't provide what, you know, especially the growers, if you can't provide what you're going to grow it with, and if, there's a, if they're not growing it legally, because there's, and it's not going to do away with the cartels and all that. I mean, Jesus, Pete, look at what Trinity County's doing right now. Come on. You know, it, it's, they're still growing illegally. It, it's doing everything, and, and like I say, I'm a proponent of it. But you have to make sure that it's done and regulated in the right way and done in the right because i don't know if the if you know cal you know uh what is it that regulates the property in the wildlife area the forest foresters not the foresters but whatever you know are are they going to allow that to even happen you know and you have to have a definitely have to have a plan that will say okay I'm going to grow it. It's going to be organic. It's going to have its own. And then on the other thing about the septic and stuff, you say, oh, it's on city water and city sewer. Well, how much is that going to tax the city water and city yeah. sewer? Thank you, Phil. We have to think about that, too. Appreciate your time. Mr. Chairman, point of personal privilege, I'm wondering if we can ask Kylie to turn them back on the cameras. The cameras. It's, thank it's, you. Yeah, thank you. Um, other public comment? Hi, I'm Robert, uh, Delmar County resident. And I wanted to thank you again for, for conducting the work group. You know, uh, I'm a stakeholder. I started Delmar Patients Together. So our group is two. You know, now my livelihood's based around it. Uh, we did. Uh, I'm on the work group, you know, and we have other people on the work group, as I said before, that kind of help balance balance out the perspective. You know, we have the, a member of the Yurok tribe. Who, the tribe is, uh, has a zero, uh, zero tolerance approach to cannabis right now. You know, they prize the salmon and they've seen what has happened on the reservation with unregulated groves and so they're taking a real cautious approach. And we've got Blake Alexander. Uh, who really prizes the, the character of a small community, I think, is really what it comes down to. And, and, and these balances to, to, to help guide us. I really think that some of the stakeholders were brought on because we actually we have a bit of expertise. You know, we've sought licensing. We've sought uh, conducting in a, in a legal atmosphere. Um, as far as... Uh, as far as the retail, I, I did want to, to, to bring up, to, to say it is very important to me that we, we do pass a retail ordinance so that we can continue on. By January 1st, we'll be in some, some, some hard water. You know, we've already gone through a lot of transitions. You know, so, so back in spring, we, we, had a, uh, we had a ban. It was a temporary ban. And it required a four-fifths vote. And three, three supervisors voted for it and two didn't. And it gave me an opportunity. And I saw the opportunity that day. And I, I applied for a license within a week of when, when, when uh, it came effect that we had no ordinance on the books. You know? And so I went through the process of being licensed and going through that transition and worrying about these huge fees that could come about if I did things wrong by the state measure. I printed up the state law. And I'm sure it's grown a couple inches. But it was, it was about this thick printed up. You know, when I printed it up, you know, and I went through all the trouble to get the camera systems and, and look into security. We're, we're training all of ourselves as security to be licensed security guards because what, what else are we going to do? We're going to be required to have a security guard. Um, we were growing, you know, our sales actually, they, they over doubled. You know, now, so, so, so we hired, you know, we hired a, a young guy, a young family person who's got a kid. We believe in a, in, a, in, a, in a living wage, and so we've kind of worked around instead of having a couple of employees trying to have one person that maybe does a little overtime here and there so they get a, 
a living wage out of it. And of course, you know, our licenses, they, were, they are dated. So on the 21st, our license expired. And we had to go back, to, well, the first, actually, there was a big transition on products. So we had to transition, you know, throw away a ton of product, you know, and supply, and supply ourselves basically for three weeks, you know, while we still had a license. And now we have the, you know, another transition of, uh, of, of trying to have enough product for the people who really need it. There are, there's a, a number of people who use these uh, cannabis oils that use it through feeding tubes, you know. Um, and so those kind of things, you know, we, we, we try to, to stock up on. And I, you know, we've, we've gone through a, a lot of hurdles. Uh, we've been a great, a great member of the community, I think. And, uh, and I appreciate, you know, as moving forward, there are going to be some issues on the, on the ordinance that, uh, you know, are unforeseen. It'll be another hurdle for someone who's getting a license, like the bond and that sort of thing. And, uh, but I think that's acceptable and, you know, thank you. Thank you. Other public comment? Tony, Crescent City. Um, I enjoyed your, your speech here, and I enjoyed what you said. Uh, he said a few things that really caught my attention. One was there's hard rules, and two, it's supposed to fit everybody. Now, if he makes allowances for this 580 feet, that's not a program that's going to fit everybody. Uh, that's about the only thing that I caught. I wish that you guys pay attention to. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, other public comment? Okay, we're going to go ahead and bring it back to the board. Joel, um, I think the board members probably give you a little bit more feedback at this time. Supervisor Gittner. You know, uh, I see Mr. Hilder left. Uh, I'm sorry to say that. I'd like to clarify something he said. He's under the impression that this is a done deal. I heard him say that. Phil, this is a done deal. Uh, right now, today, marijuana, cannabis, Mr. Rigo calls it pot. It's, it's illegal in Del Norte County. And we're here on this board to exercise one of the options provided to us by the state, which is opting out. We don't hear that very much, but we do have that option. And I'm sorry to see that uh, Mr. Alexander, who was a stalwart uh, on that option, is almost AWOL. I never see him, and I don't know what his input is on this uh, cannabis working group, which is, seems to be a group of growers. So uh, until and when and if this board decides to change that option, and basically we have a ban on it, and change that ban, it's illegal, as it is in, in federal government. And I, on a counterpart to that, much of our land in Del Norte County is owned by the federal government, which pot would never be illegally, would never be legally grown until and when and if the federal government changes its mindset and that is not there yet now, when it changes then we can have a different discussion so right now I want to remind everybody we do have a permanent pot on cannabis in Delmar County thank you any uh, more guidance for Joel at this time supervisor Supervisor um, Hemmingson. yeah I, I, I don't think we should make allowances for one individual uh, business and I would not I'm not in favor of changing uh, make, lowering our standards uh, below the state standards. Thank you. I'd actually be in agreement with that. Um, I know there's some great deal of debate about this and uh, pleading with the working group. I'm glad they were open to hearing the suggestions by one member of our community who had a retail business in uh, medical. However, I'm, I'm kind of leaning Jerry's direction. I definitely don't want to go below the state standards, but at the same time, I don't want to make a concession just for for one that had a pre-existing business. Okay. Any further comments for Joel at this time or guidance from I, the board? I think what he's looking for is consensus uh, on that. Well, you know, consensus or um, you know, an, enough input to predict what might get an approval later. Um, yeah, I, and I'm, I'm hearing it sounds like we should change that to be uniform. Okay. Right, I have no problem with the 600 feet. 600 feet? Mm -hmm. Which is the state standard. State standard, so it would be a, a thousand. So if, if, if 600 feet's not gonna accommodate this particular person, um, shouldn't we just do a thousand for both? That's where I'm leaning, um, is that thousand feet for both. Okay. 
Yeah, I, I'm good with that. I just I just don't want to go below the state standards. So. And I'm good with that also. Yeah. Okay, thank you. That's excellent. As far as the other points toward, towards your manufacturing and retail, I don't think there was other comments than what you heard. So I think with that, um, you you probably have some fairly good direction to go to the Planning Commission with, with what you've written up to date. One thing that I uh, neglected to point out is that some of this area is in the coastal zone. And so we will have uh, basically an identical ordinance that goes to coastal and we'll see what comes back. Well, it is a use permit process mm -hmm. and it is open to CEQA. So they're gonna have to jump through every hoop that anybody opening up a business or anything else has to go through around here. Mm -hmm. And I'm fairly comfortable that with our CDD staff and our current CEQA processes that we have in place, it's gonna hold very strict st standards for this thing to move forward in any direction, depending on what this board decides to move forward with as an ordinance around manufacturing and retail. I think that's right. Yep. Thank you, Joel. Thank you. All right. Oh, sorry. Didn't see you with your hand up. I just up. wanted to, um, if there was any questions or talk about, I just, I heard a few things that a couple supervisors talked about. I think particularly um, the 500 foot setback for medical being a different setback than recreational. And I think that was the main thing I heard about. Um, Supervisor Berkowitz was talking about um, timeline and, and how critical it is. Um, I don't think deadlines by, the, by January 1st are super critical. That affects retail mostly and people in the county who want access to cannabis. Um, it gets more difficult after the first of the year, but in terms of cultivation, um, it's not a hard deadline. I think just um, doing the best we can and getting things done as quickly as we can, we'll, we'll, we'll be fine. There aren't any hard deadlines that ruin anything, I don't think. Um, and then, yeah, the discussion about uh, medical versus recreational, it was a long discussion, and I think the board missed out on it a lot. You know, I think members of the public missed out on it, you know, so it's politically sensitive to, you know, for sure, when you hear it on the face, reducing state standards and things like that, you know, but um, state standards are more like state recommendations, and, and there, are, there are large one-size-fits-all kind of recommendations that's supposed to apply for every community in the entire state. And like we talk about a lot, that's not appropriate, especially for smaller communities like Del Norte County. Um, those standards were, were geared around very large cities where there's lots of places. To, there's lots of places that are 600 feet or 6,000 feet away from sensitive places. But in a small community like ours, where we're restricting it to particular commercial zones, there aren't very many places. And when you look at the maps, it comes down to the fact that there's very few viable places. Mm -hmm. um, so that was one consideration. I don't think it was about accommodating a particular person, honestly. I don't think it was about accommodating a particular business, but it was using that business as an example of what the community has come to find acceptable. We talked about having a 500 foot setback for everything because we were trying to determine what does the community consider to be acceptable? What are the metrics for that? How do we determine that? And we decided that we didn't decide, but what, what we talked about was that if we have an operation that's been in existence for over 10 years, the one we're talking about on Northcrest that's within 500 feet of a, a little more than 500 feet from a school. To me, and to the working group, that's a demonstration and proof that the community accepts that setback in all situations. Um, but that may not be appropriate in the future. Um, looking at the maps, it looks like there's space for, for a thousand foot setback. But to force a business that the community has come to accept over all these years as appropriately located and say because of a number that the state says is better, that we as a community can't do what we know is right. And that's what resonated with the working group. And that's why it was unanimous among the working group and a lot of staff that it was appropriate to make this exception. And another reason why it was appropriate, the idea of it becoming a problem, lots of places too close to sensitive things. Well, like we talked about with, with medical only outlets, it probably doesn't have a big future. It doesn't have a big expansion future, that's for sure. You're not gonna see a lot of new medical only businesses. And they definitely have a different customer base. They will in the future when you have ac recreational access a medical only establishment is going to cater to different people. They're going to carry different kinds of products that really are geared more toward medical only use. You're going to have a different stock, really. And it's going to be a different kind of business. It's more like a healthcare center, 
than a liquor store. Um, so those were kind of the considerations. And I think that when people hear reducing state standards, that scares people. You don't want to get into that. Um, different uh, rules for one over the other, not applying to everybody equally. That's not fair, but that's not what we're doing here, I don't think. And it wasn't about accommodating a particular person or one business. It really was about echoing what the community has come to the conclusion as appropriate. Um, I think that was most of what yeah. came up here with this. And Jesse, I don't want you to take this this wrong, but um, you know the, the board overall has been extremely supportive of the working group and the process that's taken place. With what Joel has brought to us this morning with some of the additions that he's taken some liberty to add into that ordinance, um, the fact that you basically heard just really one just one item that was of concern to the board it for overall that reflects extremely well on the conversations sure. that have taken place with the working group that you know the board is trusting to a certain extent that these things are being ex extremely flushed out over a great period of time to get to something that the working group believes and council believes is going to be acceptable to this board and just the discussion that took place today were just really one item one sensitive item in particular sure. uh, was an issue is to me actually a win yeah. um, because that is promising that we're going to be able to get to something that the working group and the board uh, feels is going to be acceptable to this community and um, I know it's a balance we've got people that don't want it on the working group like uh, Mr. Alexander, and you got people on the other side that do want it from various aspects of that. We're, we're getting there slowly and painstakingly, but that's extremely important to how we as a community want this to look as it rolls out, because we do know it was passed overwhelmingly in Dillard County. There is a willingness to have this here. The board will work within those parameters to get it, get it to that point. And more importantly, just want to say thank you for your time and your efforts to come here. I know it's a busy time of year for you in particular, but to continue that piece of that commitment to this as a public service has, has done a great deal of justice, not only to you and your family, but also for this community. Cool. So thank, thank you. Thank you, thank you, I agree. Appreciate you guys. Thanks. All right, um, we're gonna go ahead and move forward with item 22 at this time, which is allow staff to participate in the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation specific Southwest Fuels Management Strategic Investment Partnership Grant, either by filing an application as the lead applicant or participating as a contractor with the Tolowadini Nation, elects to take the project lead as requested by the Director of the Community Development Department. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, since the writing of this report, um, we have received some updated information. The Tolowadini Nation would like to take the lead role. Uh, in the grant application, which we think that's fantastic and we 100% we support them. Uh, they would like us still to be a partner in the project, uh, so that would include the, our roads division doing some roadside mastication and also our county egg department doing some noxious uh, weed management uh, the, within the uh, big flat area and the low divide area. So today I'm asking for um, direction whether or not that I can um, let the tribe know that we are on board to participate in the grant application. Thank you. Great, thank you, Heidi. Um, public comment on this item? Okay, seeing them, we're gonna go ahead and bring it back to the board. Staff is looking for consensus. Is there consensus to participate? There is. Okay, thank you, Heidi. All right, item number 23 on our agenda is approve and authorize the use of budgeted travel funds for Chair Howard to travel to San Francisco, California to attend the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Japan and Mr. Taro Kono's uh, visit reception scheduled for August 23, 2018. Um, received word uh, two weeks ago from um, the Council General of Japan with an invitation to the reception of uh, Mr. Taro Kono's visit to the state of California as the Minister of Foreign Affairs for Japan. Um, also, I'm aware that Mayor Blake Enscore also receives the same invitation. Um, was looking for approval from the board to attend that, and that's all I have at this time. As far as travel costs, I know folks, I, I um, would know I'd need to stay in a hotel, prefer to fly down instead of drive, but at this point, I'm 
I suspect that the hotel fees are going to be around $250 and round trip plane tickets at our current rates are going to be more like $173 or, or more. And probably some Uber type transportation while in the city. And so I'm thinking an, an overall budget in between anywhere between $500 and $600 for the trip would be needed. Is that what, that's essentially what we need to consider for this travel expense. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to uh, move that we authorize the use of the budgeted travel funds for Chair Howard to travel to San Francisco, et cetera. Thank you, Supervisor. A second. Okay. We're going to go ahead and open this up for public comment. Okay. Seeing none, we're going to go ahead and bring it back to the board. Kylie, could you please pull the vote? Supervisor Hemmingson? Yes. Supervisor Gitlin? No. Supervisor Cowan? Yes. Supervisor Berkowitz? Yes. Chair Howard? Yes. All right, let's discuss and take possible action to appoint supervisor uh, to appoint a supervisor to the California Coastal Commission as requested by Supervisor Berkowitz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As we all know by now, Humboldt County Supervisor Ryan Sunberg lost his seat. Sunberg was a member of the California Coastal Commission and represented the North Coast. Before he was appointed to the position, it was held by a former member of our board. This is a governor's appointment and has to go through, go to a county supervisor for one of three counties, Del Norte, Humboldt, and, or Mendocino. It would seem to me that our board should ask the governor to appoint someone from our board to this soon to be vacant position. Now I realize that Supervisor Sunberg will not be forced to resign before January, but we should be on record that our county desires to have a representative on the commission. There is one person on this board that I believe is well positioned to get a governor's appointment. He lo has long tenure on this board and is familiar with the issues that traditionally come before the Coastal Commission. So therefore, at this time, I'd like to nominate Supervisor Hemmingson for the position and that we send a letter to the governor that reflects our choice. Thank you, Supervisor. Comments from the board at this time? Yeah, I, I, I appreciate uh, the nomination. Um, and uh, I, I think that I would rather see um, maybe Supervisor Cowan, the, this board nominate Supervisor Cowan for that position. Um, she seems to be having a pretty good relationship with uh, Senator McGuire. Um, you know, even though I do also, but um, I think she's maybe more, I don't want to say more suited, but uh, more available for the job than I am. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, the reason that uh, Mr. Hemmingson would have a good chance at getting this is because the governor in most cases supports a person of his own party. And Mr. Hemmingson is the person in that party that would have a good chance of getting it. Yeah, I understood. Thank you. Um, other other comments from the board at this time? Let's Supervisor Cowan. Well, I, you know, I appreciate Jerry what you're saying and it's something I certainly would like to think about and uh, look further into and get more information and I've had some conversations regarding it. So I can't say I'm 100% in at this point, but I definitely am willing to um, do my due diligence on that and go forward with it. Let's go ahead and open it up for public comment just briefly. If there's any public comment. Okay, we're going to go ahead and bring it back to the board. Um, I appreciate Supervisor Berkowitz bringing this up. It's, it's always timely in a case like this to take these things under consideration. And um, I know with uh, our previous uh, elected supervisor McClure, she did represent us well, Del Norte County in particular on the California Coastal Commission. Um, probably uh, to a certain extent um, served for her demise on the California Coastal Commission also, um, but she did an excellent job on the California Coastal Commission in representing not only Del Norte County, but other coastal communities uh, across the state of California. Um, uh, supervisor Berkowitz, I, I've, I've done some research on this myself um, since you've asked for it to be considered. And one of the things that 
we're trying to predict an election at this point and where California would go with a particular governor. Um, right now, we're, we're down to two main party candidates. Um, who knows where that will turn out, what person will be in there. Past history, as you've said, serves to think that whoever gets elected to that office, that party person would potentially be appointed. Um, but we have heard some statements uh, specifically by one of those party leads, uh, Gavin Newsom, that th there's interest in actually having a more diverse panel, potentially, um, looking outside their own party, potentially for that, which I, I thought was interesting, not to say that he'll fall through with those type of promises um, during during that thing, but I, I, I did find that interesting. The, the other thing I wanted to, um, take up is that the person who, having followed this, the Coast, California Coastal Commission for a great deal of time, not only through the forest industry, but my work with Elk Valley Rancheria and now with um, being entirely in the coastal zone pretty much for, in a farming community, um, having attended the meetings, there's a great deal of time required for this position. Um, it's actually an incredible drive been very close with uh, Supervisor Sundberg uh, for many years, know what he goes through, know, know the time commitment, and I could see the concern uh, being expressed by Supervisor Hemmingson. Um, that's, that's a realistic concern. Um, California Coastal Commission requires a great deal of time. Um, if, if this is something that Supervisor Cowan is, is willing to consider, and you would have to do your due diligence because this is a serious commitment. Um, I, I I would like the board to, um, we don't necessarily maybe have to make a decision today, but I don't want this to slide off the topic either. Um, I want to do uh, this agenda item justice, Supervisor Berkowitz, and ensure that this board, to a certain extent, has vetted itself internally if we are going to nominate a candidate to the California Coastal Commission to be to be uh, taken up by the, the new governor next year, that that person is, is vetted here, and, it, and it's the right fit. Um, because, like I said, it is a massive time requirement, and if Supervisor Hemmingson, if you're not willing to to make that commitment, I and there's somebody actually willing to consider it, then that's what we need to flush out. Right, Mr. Chairman, there's one other consideration. As you know, because this is a political appointment, and this governor could make that appointment, the other thing that these governors look for, especially in local situations, is how the prominent political party of that nominee uh, is basically considered. In other words, uh, Mr. Hemmingson could get the recommendation from the local Del Norte uh, Democratic Central Committee. I doubt whether any of the other of us could get that recommendation. It's, it's a solid point to consider, I agreed. Um, any further discussion at this time? Right now I'm not seeing uh, Supervisor Hemmingson willing to take that, but at the- Well, you know, don't get me wrong, I, I'm not, you know, if, if this board, I don't want to say forced it upon me, but if, you know, I've never uh, shied away from a responsibility to do my job, um, but I do think in this particular case, I think uh, Supervisor Cowan would be a better fit, and I would throw my support for her. I'm not trying to tell this board what to do, but that's what I would do. So I, I, I see both sides of this issue. I, I agree wholeheartedly with how it's transitioned in the past for these t appointed type positions, but at the same time, I, I, I'd, I'd really like this discussion to con continue. Um, Supervisor, how do you feel this moving? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I agree with you. I think we ought to table this motion for yeah. a future meeting. Yeah, and, and maybe in the interim, um, since this was your agenda item, I'd encourage you to, to speak with whoever you feel necessary um, in the transparent manners that, that we have before us with the Brown Act to uh, try to find a, a way for us to move forward with this discussion. Because I, I, I do want to see some recommendation come out of this, out of this board. Okay. Really appreciate this coming to the, to the discussion table today. All right. Let's move on with item number 25, discussing direct staff to draft a letter to President Trump inviting him to take 
a tour of last chance grade as requested by Supervisor Berkowitz. Supervisor. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, in the last two years, our board has made a lot of progress in bringing local, state, and national attention to the problems facing last chance grade. We have invited our uh, congressmen, our state officials, to see the problems firsthand. But I think it's time that we took the issue to the next level and invited President Trump to come here and see the deteriorating condition of the road itself. Now, I'm not so bold as to think that we may actually get a visit here by the president, but it's one more way to get the administration's attention to last chance grade. You know, I have to think back uh, to 1968, believe it or not, I was in this area in 1968, when Lady Bird Johnson Grove was dedicated. No one thought President Nixon would attend, but not only did we get a sitting president to come, but we got a former president, Johnson, and a future president, Reagan, all three presidents on the North Coast at the same time. It all happened because one person thought it was important enough to send a letter of invitation. So Mr. Chairman, I'd like to move that we send a letter from our board requesting a visit from the President of the United States to come and see the condition of last chance grade. I'll second that. So we have a motion on the table and a second public comment. Aaron Skrobeck, I don't think it's a good idea at all to invite this idiot to uh, Del Norte. Um, all the riots and the uh, bad things that it would bring upon this county uh, would certainly be detrimental to um, to this community. Um, but maybe uh, some good come could come out of it. You know, I mean, they uh, could build a big wall there and uh, have Mexico pay for it. Thank you. Other public comment at this time. Okay, let's go ahead and bring it back to the board. We have a motion. That I would comment. I think Please, this is Supervisor. a. Uh, I think it's a good suggestion, uh, Supervisor uh, Berkowitz. I have been in touch with the president, and while he was a candidate, and I've appraised him. Now, whether it actually has seeped through his system and he he's aware of it, uh, we are uh, certainly deserving of getting some federal attention to this problematic area, <clears throat> which for decades has held back and caused all kinds of problems, deaths, and. Uh, uh, retarded our growth because of its access, ingress, and egress. So I would support that uh, and, and at least making the invitation, perhaps, if not the president himself, maybe uh, the vice president or an appropriate designee, interior department, you know, you just don't know how this will fan out, but I think we will get some kind of uh, acknowledgement of the request. Thank you. I didn't mean to cut you short on public comment. If, do you have a public comment at this time? I was going to say the same thing, Roger. Okay. Thank you. All right, we'll go ahead and bring it back to the board. Kylie, can you please pull the vote? Supervisor Hemmingson? Yes. Supervisor Gitlin? Yes. Supervisor Cowan? Yes. Supervisor Berkowitz? Yes. Chair Howard? Yes. All right, at this time, we're gonna take up our legislative and budget issues. Consider miscellaneous legislative and budget matters pertinent to the county of Del Norte. I'll authorize the chair to sign an appropriate letters with respect to matters pending before the state and federal governments. On today's agenda, we have item number 27, which is discuss and direct staff to draft and send a letter opposing the governor's proposal to change inverse condemnation liability in relation to wildfires as requested by Chair Howard. Um, CSAC has been uh, stalwart in ensuring that communications to the board on this particular issue has been coming out. As you're aware, part of the issue we had last year in Santa Rosa um, and Sonoma County in a whole the fires were essentially caused by utility um, failing and starting that that devastating wildfire in Sonoma County. Um, from that, the utility providers in the area, in this case PG&E and, and others, found it extremely uh, liable, insurance-wise, to stomach the burden of what it's going to cost for essentially cleanup of a great deal of these destructive type fires that come through and wipe out entire communities. Um, CSAC has taken a position um, to wholeheartedly fight uh, this proposal by utilities to try to get or get around or circumvent their liability associated with a utility lightning caused fire. Um, to me, uh, 
and to those members on CSAC, we think it's extremely important that if a, a fire is started by utility from lack of maintenance or other causes associated with lack of maintenance of their utility infrastructure, which we pay a great deal to maintain, um, that they should be held liable if a fire were to be caused and caused a great deal of destruction like we've seen in Sonoma County and, and don't feel that the legislature should uh, allow them a pass per se to uh, work their way out of this type of situation just because they, they don't want to stomach the entire burden of that cleanup. Um, so at this point in time, I'd like us to direct staff to uh, send a letter opposing the governor's proposal for that change inverse condemnation liability piece and uh, see if we have some willingness by the board to move that kind of letter forward. Um, it could be a consensus or a motion, depending on... We do have consensus. All right. I'd like to open it up for public comment. Okay, seeing none, we're going to go ahead and bring it back to the board. Uh, yeah, I just have, I just have a couple of things uh, came to mind, and, and I certainly uh, uh, don't think that uh, uh, utilities uh, sh uh, should not be responsible, but, um, you know, it all comes down to the ratepayers eventually anyway, so we're all going to have to pay for it, which was one thought. The other thought was uh, here a number of years ago, uh, Pacific Power was trying to do maintenance on their line. And that um, request to the parks system sat on their desk for three years. And they did, the park service never did, allowed them to go on their property because it got held up for three years. And it's maintenance that they wanted to do. So that concerns me a little bit. Uh, I think that's probably a factor um, that, that they could deal with. But just those kind of things, you know, where, uh, where they're trying to do maintenance and can't do it, um, I think is an issue. Although I, I support, you know, I support writing the letter because I don't think anybody should shirk their responsibility, even though we're going to end up having to pay for it. Yeah. Understood, and thank you. At this important time, um, Jay, we do have consensus to move forward with that. Is there any other um, issues that we need to consider, budgetary or otherwise? Uh, not issues at this point, but the auditor controller is finalizing the end of the year. He has one department that is still working on their final transfers. He's projected out um, a tentative fund balance that we're working with right now, and we're going through our round two, two meetings, and uh, we will be coming before the board at the August 28th meeting with um, a presentation and a workshop in order to get the priorities from the board so that we can start working on that final number once it's determined. Uh, we should know, I, I would think, by the end of the week what the, the final number number is because that transfer will be completed. Thank you, Jay. Questions for Jay at this time? Okay, very good. Well, let's go ahead and move on to our final item on the agenda. Actually, um, Lori, why don't you read the proclamation into the record, please, before we move on to that final item. This is a proclamation of Breastfeeding Awareness Month, August 2018, whereas breastfeeding is an issue of great importance to women, infants, their families, and their community. And whereas all available research demonstrates that breastfeeding provides numerous advantages to the growth, development, and overall health of infants while significantly decreasing the incidence of a large number of acute and chronic diseases. And whereas exclusive breastfeeding recommended by the American Academy of Pediatrics and the Healthy People 2020 objectives are to increase the percentages of infants who are breastfed. And whereas breastfeeding promotes healthier individuals and benefits the community with lower health care costs for infants and mothers. And whereas breastfeeding promotes healthier mothers to, by decreasing the risk of breast uterine and ovarian cancer, as well as the occurrence of postpartum depression, mood and anxiety disorders. <clears throat> and whereas breastfeeding is vital to the growth and maintenance of the developing infant brain and the promotion of the maternal infant bond and cannot be manufactured. And whereas the people of Del Norte County are deserving of good health. 
Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Board of Supervisors of the County of Del Norte that August 2018 is hereby proclaimed as Breastfeeding Awareness Month throughout Del Norte County and calls upon its citizens, government agencies, public and private institutions, businesses and schools to recognize the efforts of breastfeeding mothers and their families, healthy professionals, the Del Norte County Breastfeeding Coalition, and the Del Norte County Department of Health and Human Services Public Health Branch, who provide support and encouragement to mothers to succeed with breastfeeding, passed and adopted this 14th day of August, 2018. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor. All right, we'll move forward uh, to receive re brief reports from uh, our supervisors. Supervisor Cowan, can you please kick us off? Um, had an interview with the RCTA, uh, a company that's doing some interviews to discuss where we want to, where we would like the lines to go and just future goals of, uh, the RCTA Redwood Coast Transit Authority. Spoke with code enforcement regarding ongoing issues on Pebble Beach Drive and good news is when I checked yesterday, those have been taken care of. Uh, had a mental health meeting. Um, actually we've had a couple, uh, well we had a, a meeting with no place like home uh, to kind of just go over what I discussed earlier and where we're going as a group and how we want to move forward the visitors bureau meeting ongoing developing with the marketing firm and um, they've been coming to us with a lot of ideas and we're putting together a group of outsiders as well uh, business leaders and other people in the community um, to start to get their opinion as well um, had a meeting with um, Senator McGuire regarding Sutter Coast and the dialysis center. Um, a lot of you know there's a dialysis center that just hasn't opened yet. We're waiting on, um, or the company is waiting on state licensing. Um, Senator McGuire has been a big help in going to the state and making that licensing a tier one priority to help move it along. So things are moving um, a little bit quicker now the last couple of weeks, which is great, great news. And again, I, the Senator is always there to help. Every time I call him with something, he's just wonderful. Met with a neighbor recently, a constituent, regarding some blight in her neighborhood that I'll deal with today. And quite honestly, the last couple of weeks um, has been primarily family time for me. I was able to welcome my two daughters home who went to Thailand to do volunteer work and to work on um, primitive agriculture and to do some teaching of English. And they came home. And then my daughter, Sarah, went off to... Um, Australia and she started classes yesterday at the University of um, Queensland doing uh, marine biology for the fall semester was able to take my son down to Santa Barbara um, for four days with him and his girlfriend just did a lot of exploring and ended of this weekend with moving my oldest daughter into her new apartment in Chico where she's going to Chico State to um, become a teacher <laughs> so um, she's doing really well out there the one thing I noticed in the last couple of weeks traveling from here all the way down to Santa Barbara up and down the California coast is uh, it's just been a really big reminder to me of all the suffering that's going on with these fires. Um, I was um, on communicating with the senator last night when he got notice of we lost another firefighter in Mendocino last night. And you know, it's just a constant reminder of the loss of both life and property coming up up the five through, is it Hornbrook? Um, yep. Sunday, uh, just utter devastation. So, you know, I ask everybody just to keep everybody, um, people in their thoughts and their prayers as we go forward. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor. Supervisor Berkowitz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, last month, I had a meeting with the new publisher of the triplicate, Kim Fowler. We talked about the current issues surrounding the editor. She admitted that the triplicate has had problems in the past, but she's working on them in order to make the triplicate a better paper. It would seem that she's off to a good start with the editorial opinion that appeared in last Saturday's edition, and also today's article about our agenda of what was coming at this particular meeting. I don't think we've seen that in an awful long time. I attended the Crescent City Del Norte County Chamber of Commerce where the 4th of July festivities were reviewed and the consensus was that it was a very successful 4th. 
This year's Delnor County Fair seemed to have been well attended. The commercial building had every booth full of people. I was especially heartened to see that our 4-H and FFA kids fetched good prices for their animals. Um, I also attended the Cannabis uh, Working Group. Uh, I thought it was a very good meeting and uh, I was interested to uh, see what they would come out with at today's meeting. So at this time, Mr. Chairman, I would like to request that we include on next month's agenda a discussion and action of placing porta potties on South Beach uh, and put that on the agenda. Uh, I think it's uh, timely. I think we've done this before, but we haven't done it on a consistent basis. And maybe not doing it during the winter, but maybe doing five or six months out of the year. And maybe, just maybe, we might find other methods of funding it, such as a GoFundMe uh, situation, or volunteers, or just people who want to contribute to make sure that the beaches are clean. So. Uh, if we could uh, um, have that as a requested item for next, next month's meeting. Great. Kylie, could you please take note of that? Thank you. Can I just get clarifi uh, clarification on next month? Does he mean the first meeting in September or the next meeting in August? Next meeting in August, please. Okay. Thank you. Supervisor Hemmingson. Yes, thank you. Um, I had a meeting with... Uh, community development staff, uh, Supervisor Howard, the Farm Bureau, RCD, uh, along with the Water Resources staff uh, to talk about the Sigma issue that we already addressed today. Um, I spent a couple of days in Santa Rosa uh, at a whale entanglement conference. Um, we're moving right along with legislation uh, to deal with that. Um, I did attend the fair, uh, attended uh, the Uncle Cracker uh, concert. Uh, which was uh, probably the uh, best attended um, concert uh, that I've been to for as long as I've been at the fair. Um, uh, put on a pretty good show. I uh, also went to the rodeo and uh, the other uh, entertainment with my grandkids, uh, rides and such uh, at the fair. Had a great time. It was very well attended. Uh, had meeting with staff as well as Supervisor uh, Cowan, uh, Mayor Inscore, and Councilman Short on No Place Like Home uh, grant. Uh, CAO uh, Serena was there. Uh, we had some discussion on that uh, $75,000 a grant that we're supposed to be awarded, the technical grant, so we're working on that. I dealt with some constituent complaints. Uh, also had a Border Coast Regional Airport Authority meeting. Uh, where we uh, publicly announced that Randy Ho Hooper, uh, who you well know from uh, community development, will be our new uh, airport director. Uh, we're looking forward to that beginning. Um, unfortunately, lo uh, losing him from the county uh, is a big loss, uh, but uh, hopefully we'll get that all worked out. That's it for me. Thank you very much. Supervisor Gitlin. Yes, thank you. Uh, well, the day after... Uh, our last meeting, I met with the Del Norte Unified School District Superintendent Jeff Harris uh, and a constituent uh, to discuss the bidding process uh, for those who wish to do business with the district. And there was some confusion, and we got it cleared up. Their uh, specialists were there, and uh, smooth sailing also. Spent some time at the fair for a few, couple of days, met lots of wonderful people, enjoyed all the great exhibits. Uh, also participated in a survey conducted by the Redwood Coast Transit Authority on its short-range transportation goals. We'll be discussing it tomorrow at our RCTA meeting. So I shared my priorities uh, with the interviewer, uh, which seemed to be more or less common sense and how we can get more and more people out of their vehicles and onto the buses, especially when it comes to entering and leaving our parks, the roads are terrible there, and uh, we want to be helpful in that area. Uh, traveled to UCSF for um, a three-month evaluation of my spinal fusion. Happy to report the doctors gave me a thumbs up on my recovery. I want to give a special thanks to all the good folks at John Knox and Del Norte Physical Therapy, where I continue my therapy there. Uh, met at our bi-monthly Pelican Bay State Prison Advisory Meeting. Uh, current population is 
just a slightly over 2,600, and that's where it's been lowered to. There are 100 plus in level one, and on the board, we again discussed the re-implementation of work crews to provide services in Del Norte County, particularly on the median where um, no one but state employees can go to clean up the median. Uh, Warden Robertson, uh, who is a supporter of deploying level one uh, incarcerants out there into the community and as they transition back into the society, uh, is a great supporter of this and he's asked for documentation for of the CDCR work program when the prison opened in 1989. So that's being researched. Tony tells me that they're working on that. Um, and um, I'm hopeful that by in a foreseeable future we'll have some kind of uh, uh, offer from CDCR to begin this program if at least on a modest basis uh, we'll see some uh, work crews available to us and uh, I'm hopeful we'll see that at our October 10th meeting. Also, all the supervisors received uh, an email from CSAC, which is our California State Association of Counties, on uh, Prop 6, which, first of all, it was announced that it did make the ballot. Now, Prop 6 is the retraction of SB 1, which is the uh, state transportation bill. SB 1 is a very flawed bill, and it hurts Del Norte County. Price of gas goes dramatically higher, 12 to 19 cents a gallon more uh, for gas and or uh, diesel. Our DMV fees go up in, in, in arguably what is one of the poorest counties in the state. We've had this situation going on. And I had a discussion, came into discussion, with one of the folks at CSAC, and I explained to her that this is not just a Del Norte County issue, it's hurting us. There are, and I counted, there were 15 counties, uh, actually 14 including Mexico, where someone can drive across the border and buy things, such as gasoline, and, uh, and save money. Now, we say, well, how does that hurt us? Because we have six service stations here, and their business is going to be hurt here in Del Norte County by simply people just saying, well, let's go up to Brookings, we'll do some shopping, and uh, we'll get some gas up there and we'll buy whatever, all tax-free. So. Um, I'm going to ask this board to uh, send uh, a message to a CSAC, or rather the Aurora Counties Association, which is called RCRC. Supervisor Hemmingson is our representative um, to have this brought up at the September 19th to 21st meeting uh, about the impact of SB1 on rural counties and how it is hurting us and how there have to be some changes so that we are not uh, ex we're not continuing to be penalized at the cost of these exorbitant increases in services and of course the loss of revenue from tax revenue so i'm going to ask our board if you would mind uh, mr chairman have this on the on the agenda next week to have a discussion uh, ask our our supervisor hemmingson who is our representative RC, RC to have this on as a discussion and action item on Prop 6, which we all have a lot to learn about in the coming weeks and uh, 83 days before the election, and the punitive aspects of SB 1 as it impacts rural counties. Kylie, could you please make note? Uh, uh, if I could, if I could interrupt right there, I've already made that case. I've already done it. Uh, uh, I abstained on voting for uh, for. Uh, that uh, RCRC has, has come out opposed uh, to that uh, Prop 6 or whatever it is, the opposition to SB1, already been through, already done, uh, asked and answered, um, So, and it's coming up again. We're talking about it again at this next meeting tomorrow. So uh, my same concerns will come out, just like they have, as always. Um, so there's no reason to have some special board meeting over it already done Thank you. supervisor Gitlin how do you see this different than the discussion we had last well, year in the I letter we it. sent I do see it a little differently with all due respect to supervisor Hamilton the abstention is is bothersome we are all here in office to make a position um, yes or no on anything when you abstain from something we don't get anything accomplished and I don't think an abstention is serves in the best interest this is my opinion of Del Norte County when it comes to the punitive aspects of SB1 on our county. 
loss of revenue and the high price of gasoline and diesel when someone can drive 26 miles into Brookings and fill up at, at as much as 65 to 75 cents a gallon less uh, we ignore this we're not thinking of our folks now I think this is just not Delnor County as I said there's 14 other counties uh, that border some Oregon Nevada Arizona where this is a reality now uh, whether supervisor Hemmingson disagrees with it or not I think that's up for our board to decide as we he is our delegate to RCRC it's not his and his alone opinion on what to do it's he's representing our board now obviously you see some uh, some disagreement on how we should approach prop 6 I've had the discussion with CSAC they acknowledge some of my arguments and certainly there needs to be some amendment of SB 1 so it doesn't fall heavy on our county I've, I've had this discussion with uh, uh, the RCRC head and he said he'd like to talk about it again now uh, whether it's one two three or four times somewhere along the line uh, it'll galvanize and there's going to be an election in November and I would venture to say if any of you out here at this point point know even what prop 6 does or doesn't do I would say you probably don't so we need to be educated on that whether it is in fact good or bad it's going to be on the November ballot so that's my position on this uh, and I can't uh, you know I just have to reiterate I've already made all the points uh, that, uh, that uh, Supervisor Gitlin has just said I can't make it any clearer on my concern with this bill um, I said that it's counterproductive they're not going to get any more tax money out of Delmar County it's not going to happen because those people are just going to there's just going to be more people go north retail business is going to go with them already made those points do we need to make those points again? It was overwhelmingly uh, voted to oppose that proposition that is against SB1 by RCRC, overwhelmingly. Um, there were a few counties that voted against it. Uh, I think one other county abstained, as I did. Um, but it was overwhelmingly supported. And I don't know who you talked about to uh, at the head of RCRC, but I'm telling you right now, it's not coming back before RCRC to be voted on. <clears throat> to be clear, this would be a discussion not on SB1, but SB6. Proposition 6. Um, whether or not um, S SB1's law, it's been law. What's on the ballot today is Proposition 6, as uh, Supervisor Gitlin's requested. Um, I know both CSAC and RCRC um, have had a great deal of debates. Myself, uh, on the same side on CSAC, have had this debate, have taken this same position as authorized by this board to take with the letter that we sent, um, which at that point, it was a fairly neutral position that was taken by the board at that time. But we expressed in that letter that went to not only the governor, but our representatives and to CSAC and RCRC, um, we made the same points that Supervisor Gitlin has expressed in that letter that went to both both the uh, Haller electeds and in this case uh, CSAC and RCRC. But if this is going to be a discussion specific to a position on Proposition 6, and I'm willing to hear that. Is that correct? Okay. Kylie, can you please make note of that? All right. Is that it? Okay. All right. I'm going to move on with my report. I uh, had a meeting with Michael Thornton and Brittany Reimer uh, from Building Healthy Communities on the homeless issue that you heard a great deal of discussion about today and, and how that discussion would uh, be facilitated today. I thought they did a, a wonderful job on trying to get consensus on how this community can move forward with a, a problem that we all recognize here. Um, as Supervisor Hemmingson brought up, we've been spending a, a tremendous amount of time on the State Groundwater Management Act issues and how DWR has represented uh, the data. Um, it's been a long time in coming, but we do have an opportunity now to reverse course from our median prioritization and get down to a category that is more reflective of our actual data here in Dillnart County. Really appreciate staff's time, especially Mr. Hooper's time, in helping to coordinate that response to the Department of Water Resources. Um, had a discussion with the Talawadini Nation recently on issues surrounding Highway 101 and their willingness to revisit discussions around an MOU with Dillnart County. Um, they've 
requested a copy at that time of uh, the Elk Valley Rancheria's MOU, which I've passed on to them. Um, and I know they're also requesting here pretty soon that we reconvene as a two by two and at that time uh, we'll reach out to Supervisor Hemmingson when that does occur so we can move forward with hopefully a, a great discussion. Um, attended a couple meetings uh, of our uh, so-called working group uh, to a certain extent from folks that have visited uh, Ritz's and Takata, Japan and areas of interest that the group shares in moving forward both culturally, educationally, and economically, but more importantly around disaster preparedness. Um, CAO Serena had attended our last discussion around this and really coming up with some um, more proactive approaches, not, rec not just uh, standing still to a certain extent, um, recognizing that there's always willingness to change, that Delnark County, more importantly, has um, taken a great deal on being the most prepared community on the Pacific Coast, both through South America, Central America, and North America, being designated one of the most prepared communities for a tsunami to occur. However, that does not mean we stand still. It does not mean we look to more adaptive ways to prepare our community and its citizen if we were to have a near shore event which is what the citizens of Riches and Takata have asked us to do, and more importantly, recognize their failures as a community where so many lives were lost. So we'll continue having those discussions with staff and those folks of interest in trying to move forward with uh, how do we better communicate a near shore event to our community so there's not such a devastating loss of life. Um, our Smith River Neighborhood Watch meeting last week was uh, particularly timely and important. I know uh, Community Development Department, uh, Board of Supervisors, our Delnort Local Transportation Commission, we've had a great deal of discussion about this over the years. But in particular, a stretch of highway extending from the Fred Hay Drive Bridge um, and all the way to our Oregon border has been um, a mecca, a magnet for traffic accidents, near misses and collisions that have claimed lives over a number of years. In particular this year, we've seen a rise in congestion along the stretch of highway that have caused uh, fatalities to occur. At the Neighborhood Watch meeting, we convened Kevin Tucker from Caltrans and also David Morgan from Caltrans and a CHP representative, Chris uh, Mullins, who had a conversation with the community on how we could work with the state Department of Transportation on moving the discussion forward that recognizes that as we grow in this tourism-based community that we're, we're certainly on course for right now, um, how do we wrestle with these traffic congestion problems that are causing so many near misses along our state highway north of the Smith River? Um, to a certain extent, there's very problematic communities as you saw Jessica with a triplicate outline recently in the newspaper article that appeared this weekend, but more importantly, getting to a point on how we could give the state data that they could react to and more importantly fund uh, turn pockets or other necessary traffic congestion type devices that would help prevent near misses and save lives is what we're trying to work towards at this point. But I just want to say we really appreciate everybody's time and efforts and especially the Smith River community to continue having this as a forefront to uh, our entire Department of Transportation in um, trying to build consensus. Uh, attended a gender review, also attended a, a, a smoke-free uh, community housing meeting that um, Amber Weir is helping to head. This was a second meeting. We hope to have an ordinance in the future for the board to consider on what maybe smoke-free housing would look like in the county. Um, also had a conversation with uh, David Sagel of the Hambro Group about wood fiber opportunities that they're exploring within uh, Delnort County and uh, attended a meeting of the uh, uh, Morrison Creek Working Group which was hosted by the uh, Resource Conservation District about flooding issues around Morrison Creek and short-term solutions that we're working on right now to be implemented this summer. The uh, first phase of that, of those short-term solutions would be to do some flood control efforts to decrease the amount of aggregation in Morrison Creek that causes closure of our roads for a certain period of time during large storm events. Um, 
As everybody's mentioned, the fair was quite interesting this year and exciting. It was good to see all the smiling faces of the kids and also participated again this year in helping to uh, host the, uh, the junior livestock action and referee those bids as they were coming in to ensure that those kids got the highest prices they could for their animals. And uh, lastly, I just wanted to recognize um, Mr. Hooper, as Supervisor Hemmingson brought up, he's been an incredible employee for the Community Development Department. I know uh, Ms. Kungstel is going to miss him greatly, but he's moving on to uh, fulfill an extremely important role for this community on our Border Coast Regional Airport Authority as director. And I, I know he's not going far, and knowing Randy, he'll continue to participate at a lot of different levels to assist our Community Development Department in moving forward. Appreciate everybody's time and staying with us today. Look forward to seeing you in two weeks.